Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV's podcast 488. Tim Miller, the disc golf guy, not quite next to Johnny V tonight. Tonight, we're going remote, I'm doing this thing from home. You were and, a little lazy, uh, we... didn't want to come over. I mean, <laughs> yep. I don't think you put mm -hmm. pants on today, probably. That's my guess. Uh, maybe, I'm not, maybe I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Uh, that's for the after after show. <laughs> uh, regardless, yes, yeah, a little bit of snow coming through Wisconsin in the Midwest. Uh, in fact, I talked to uh, a gentleman down in Kansas today, and he said they got 10 inches, which is far more than what we actually received here in Wisconsin. So I feel like a little bit of a baby, but they, they ki our kids both had schools called off. Uh, they were anticipating, I think, even more than what we received. And since we haven't had any snow this year, uh, they decided to be extra cautious on everyone today. So kind of a weird day in Wisconsin and probably throughout the Midwest. Yeah, I heard like 70% of our country is under some sort of uh, cold advisory. You know, obviously that changes mm. depending on where you're at. The cold advisory in Oklahoma and northern Texas is going to be a little bit different than a cold advisory here. But I know, obviously, with something like Oklahoma, they get hit with a lot of ice storms. Um, but anyway, in Texas versus, you know, Arizona. So we're talking to a friend in Arizona today. It was 32 degrees there. Not, yeah, that's... Yeah, that's the, the, they, and they ain't ready for that. <laughs> no, and they, they, they shouldn't be rivaling what we're seeing in Wisconsin because no. we were in that neighborhood. So uh, understandable if everyone's a little chilly out there. So hopefully everybody is safe. I know there's parts of the country without power i know there was a tornado that uh, went through in the in the the gulf area so hopefully everyone is safe so uh tonight uh here in our second podcast of 2024 a couple of very special guests uh i think without further ado we're gonna get right to our first one i don't know how he hasn't been on here maybe he took offense to that maybe that's why he decided <laughs> to go kick, start his own kick-ass podcast and he does some incredible things and we're talking about jesse stedman from trash panda jesse how you doing, man? Deeply offended and excited <laughs> to be here. So thanks for having me on. Which is, mo to be yeah. honest, that's probably most of our guests. Deeply offended, <laughs> but excited to be on. <laughs> I'm, I'm of course kidding. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Happy to be inside. Uh, like mm -hmm. you talking about the weather in Denver, we're having the same. So it's been quite chilly lately. Okay. And you, you're a guy, unlike Johnny and I, who just, you know, now talk and live and breathe disc golf, but you go out and like day to day experience it. You're molding and shaping and doing things. And then like you're making a video out of it. I feel like every other day or, or on definitely more of a content creation schedule. Yeah. We're definitely living and breathing disc golf over here. Not to be confused with playing disc golf. Um, mm, okay. My, uh, my longest streak on UDisc last year, week to week, was one. So um, we don't okay. play a lot of disc golf when we work in disc golf, uh, but loving it nonetheless and doing what I love. Easily the number one misconception, I think, in our entire sport, <laughs> right? That, well, I'm just going to get a job in disc golf and then I'll play it all the time. And if you're doing your job well, and you love it, you're probably not playing too much, unless it's exclusively as a professional. Yeah. All right, yeah. Jesse. So let's let's get to the basics. Uh, I, I think it would be crazy that someone watches us that doesn't know who you are and what you do. But nonetheless, this is your first time here. So uh, rather than me try to screw anything up, why don't you go ahead and give us your, your full introduction? Tell us you know, what you've been doing and, and why we should know you and what you've been up to the last, the last few years. Yeah, so I started a company called Trash Panda Disc Golf. So our whole mission is about sustainability, and specifically we do that by making discs out of 100% recycled plastic. So that's kind of our shtick and the very high-level version of it. Um, but, you know, people might have run across us on YouTube or Instagram. Content is a big part of what we do. Storytelling is a big part of what we do. Um, also, brand partnerships are huge for us. So those are kind of our three things. It's content, manufacturing, and partnerships. So someone might have seen us through one of those <laughs> things. Um, or if you've seen a blue unstamped disc out in the world, likely it was <laughs> one of ours. That's another That's another thing. But yeah, we... Uh, we're most known for making discs uh, out of 100% recycled plastic. 
So the recycled plastic you get, that's not necessarily recycled discs. That's just general recycled plastic. That could be, heaven forbid, water bottles or any sort of plastic that's out in the environment. Is that correct? Totally. Specific to the plastic that's used for um, premium and baseline plastic discs, it's typically something that's coming from either like a, if it's not a disc, so we do recycle discs. Um, however, if it's not a disc, it's likely going to be coming from medical, automotive, sporting good, agriculture type industries. Um, TPU is premium plastic and it's like, it's not your go-to plastic water bottle or, um, you know, takeout container, but it might be the soft plastic on your toothbrush. It might be the, the all weather floor mats in your car. So it's all around and it's crazy abundant, but specifically like plastic water bottles, um, those would not make the best discs in the world <laughs> just because of the type of plastic. Uh, well, and backing up even more so than that, of course, I think it's uh, an incredible journey and effort and everything that you've accomplished. Where, where did this come from? Like, what is this your background? Is this what you studied in school? You know, how, how did you arrive yeah. at the idea? Hey, let's quit. Yeah. Uh, let's quit doing no. this. No, not in the slightest as my background. So I, I started playing disc golf in 2008. Um, I was a freshman in high school and just found the sport, fell in love with it, played. I mean, summers in high school and college, it was daily. There were times throughout the semester that it would be daily. It became quickly my like top hobby. And for many, I think many, I think can relate to this. It became therapy for me. It was just like, the the thing i would go out and do solo i would spend so much time doing it and i absolutely loved it funny enough never played a pdj sanctioned event for all all those 12 years leading up to starting trash panda i'm not a super competitive guy but it was it just became this thing that i loved and there was never like this specific moment but i remember throughout all of that time thinking we're using so much plastic and we're outside where's the recycled plastic and we would see it here and there, but it really wasn't like talked about and there wasn't a lot of it. And not being my background, I thought simple, I could make a disc out of recycled plastic in my garage. How hard could it be? So mm -hmm. actually the origin story of Trash Panda is one that a lot of people are familiar with too. Um, but I built an injection machine in my garage that operated, it injected on my body weight. Like I would hang on the bar mm -hmm. and it would inject the disc. And that was kind of how we prototyped for the first couple of years. That was how we made our first products. And um, I learned how hard it was and how complicated this simple idea I had was. But I'm so happy I was naive because had I not been naive, we were actually talking about this as a team today. You know, now I have a staff of people like we're, we're doing this daily and we were talking as a team to, today about the dangerous um, combination of passion and naivete. <laughs> and that's kind of where we started. When you, when you saw that, the, the disc, and then you thought, oh, hey, why am I not doing this? Or, or maybe, hey, I could make this. Clearly, like you said, you didn't necessarily know everything that went into it. What, what's been the most... I mean, there's so much you've learned, but what do you feel like has been maybe the most surprising or maybe the most underrated that just people don't think about or realize in, in a disc making process? I mean, plastic, it, it, when I started, plastic is plastic is plastic. Yes, we all have like, we all know that there's different versions and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, in my head, when I started, I knew nothing. I was like, you could combine them all. You can recycle them together, whatever. Like, why couldn't there be a plastic mm -hmm. water bottle and a disc? And now it's like, I'll, I'll, I'll go through a couple of the steps of how complex it was. So first we started with polypropylene and high density polyethylene. Those are two of the most common post-consumer worldwide plastics out there. They make absolutely horrible discs. Um, they can be used in the <laughs> disc process, but they by themselves are, you know, super hard trash can lid kind of things. Um, so started there, learned that 
there were multiple types of plastic. So you've got your ones through sevens, right? On the bottom of a product, you're going to have a number one or a number two or number three. I was like, okay, at least I know now there's seven types of plastic. Turns out number seven, I went through all seven. By the time I got to seven, number seven stands for mixed. And that means every other type of plastic <laughs> out there. So now I'm like, okay, I, all of a sudden there's thousands of types of plastic and I start going through those. Eventually we find, this is years by the way of learning, but <laughs> we find that TPU is fantastic. I could show you a TPU that is a floppy disk and I could show you the hardest disk you've ever felt in your life that's TPU. Because TPU also isn't just TPU, but there are hundreds of variations of TPU. So it just like, as you dive, I'm sorry if that got a little technical, but it not like, at all. Plastic seems so simple when in reality, not only is what we're using complex TPU being the base plastic and premium plastics being one of the hardest plastics plastics to mold with in the injection molding industry outside of disc golf. Um, mm. Then you're talking about making a product that's going to fly 400 feet exact same every single way or every single time and not only that but the injection machine now adds comp complexities and then if you add one color versus another color you add complexities it just i could keep going all night i won't <laughs> we don't need to do that but it's so complex the fact that you could get two discs that fly the same is mind-blowing to me so it's it's what disc golf companies i get it it's manufacturer specifically. It's their Coca-Cola secret. They don't want to share a lot, but what they have done is mind blowing. And I wish they would share more so we could all just have a deeper appreciation for how hard it truly is. I'm interested I in the injection molder that you made in your garage. Did you just Google, like go to YouTube and be like DIY injection molder? Like how? What what did you do to, because I'm thinking right now, how would I do that? Well, the first thing I would do is I would go to YouTube and be like, how do I make an yep. injection molder and figure out and then like watch like 50,000 videos of people probably doing, you know, tell me how easy it is. Tell me how hard it is. Tell me how great it is. And then from there, like, is that, is that yeah. kind of, I mean, I wish it was a fancier story, but yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. It's a. Uh, I'm a learn by doing kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So it was very much like found, um, there was a company called precious plastic that had a bunch of open source machine, um, drawings and designs for like DIY recycling equipment, especially for gl the global recycling community in places where they could source things and they couldn't source things. So think anywhere from Denver to a third world country, they could make these machines. And I kind of just adapted the plans and built it off of that. But it was really a learn by doing. I, I, I recall one of your videos, you were, as you said, you were literally like pulling a lever and then just like jamming on it, basically, to try and get it to go through, yeah. uh, it, <laughs> which is just hilarious. I mean, you got that's when you call them the big dogs. You know, if you need a little more of that weight, I, I'm here for you. <laughs> but uh, I mean, thinking about seeing some of these modernized machines and i i've had the pleasure of being at the latitude factory in sweden and i've seen uh disc made at legacy and at a few other places watching them spit out you know more than a disc a minute and some of it completely automated was your goal or is your goal to be on a mass like a um, mass production schedule to to be making yeah, that's, that's so a great many question. of these. I, I don't know that I, I had a lot of goals when I set out, but I'm not sure I had specifics in terms of exactly how and what that would look. Cause again, this wasn't my background. My background was more on the marketing side of things, which is why we had 10,000 subscribers before we ever had a disc, right? Like that, yeah. because my background's there, not here. So in terms of scale, really when it comes down to it, the goal is to talk the talk and walk the walk. We are on a mission to inspire people to live sustainably and we're trying to do it ourselves. And so our goal is to divert as much plastic from landfills as possible. We want to recycle as much plastic as possible. Does that mean 
mass production. Um, likely it means we've, we've bumped up production. We actually, when we went, so we started with minis in the garage on that machine. I made actually, um, we started selling them and I made 5,000 before we scaled our manufacturing. And that was one by one. It took like 10 minutes to make a mini. It was ridiculous. Um, it took 30 minutes to just to prototype a disc at a time and likely it would be a second or a third, right? So mm -hmm. by the time we released our first disc, we had scaled manufacturing with a local manufacturing partner here in Denver. So we have a partnership with a local injection molder and because of, because of the scale we'd reached on YouTube and with our story and our mission and the people who had really joined the community, we knew that releasing a disc was not possible in the garage. So to some extent, we've already scaled that, that first, literally the first drop of, uh, of the inner core, which was our first disc sold 10,000 discs. And that would have taken me two lifetimes. So it, I'm very glad we scaled at that point. Um, but yeah, we, we continue to scale because we continue to recycle more plastic and that's, that's what we're all about. How well, you... that brings up my next, I was just gonna say real quick, that brings up my next question, which is, is there a different feel because somebody says, Hey, at, I'm buying a disc. I need a more disc. You're trying to reduce plastic and plastic use but yet you're producing more plastic well you're not really producing more you're recycling it so is do you know do you see how somebody could like maybe totally. come at you with you know some kind Harry, of almost Harry, like hypocritical those, perspective yeah we get those comments daily 100 okay okay um oh, good i'm not I original could... i never i never claimed i was original <laughs> <laughs> no we get those we people definitely have their opinions on it um the reality is that disc golfers want more discs and manufacturers are making more discs. And if you were to ask some of the big manufacturers in the space, um, why isn't there more recycled plastic? They will tell you point blank. There hasn't been a market for recycled plastic. I like at trash Panda, we're on a mission to prove that there's a market. Our win ultimately is when everyone else does it too. So discs are going to continue to be made. Um, I would love to see not just Trash Panda being the ones making discs, but you know, everyone doing it. Are we making more? Yeah. Would it be more sustainable to never start a business and do absolutely nothing in terms of sheer footprint? Maybe, but I believe that inspiration and building up a community of people who are acting in a certain way is going to, in the long run, have significantly more value than I myself ever, ever could. Uh, you'll have to forgive me because I'm not, I don't recall, but maybe Terry even has a good idea. Um, wasn't Innova's Echo line an originally yeah. some recycled plastic back in the day? I don't know if they're still doing that. I have some old Echo Star, I think, destroyers from way back in the day somewhere hiding around. Yeah. So I, 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 I believe it has been done, but I don't, I don't know if they're still doing it. Do you? Do you know if they're still yeah, doing yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first, you should put those on eBay because I'm pretty sure there's like a cult following for the old Echo Destroyers. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. Second, That's why Dave Feldberg <laughs> lost the world championships this year. I, th that's a story for another day. But we'll, we'll right. get Dave to share yeah. that one with us. <laughs> Go the, on. Uh, I'll tune in for that. The So, yeah, there other companies have done recycled. Um, our big thing is 100% recycled. So Echo Star specifically on... Innova's website, you'll find that it's up to 50% recycled. That's kind of their mm. story. Um, and it's recycled using um, their in-house waste, which is mm. fantastic. I'm not in any way trying to detract that. We've, we've also proven that you can get plastic from other industries and the disc golf industry could hypothetically not produce any virgin plastic, which would be insane. Um, so that's kind of like there's there there are subtle differences here. But if anyone's doing something with recycled plastic, I, like I'm I'm a fan. It's it doesn't just have to be Trash Panda. So yeah, it, you've got Innova's Echo Star. You've got the House of Disc kind of conglomerate, really trilogy. Before that, had their Latitude line or their, sorry, their latitude line, their recycled line. Um, you've got, you know, Castaplast did a super small regrind line. Uh, 
they're they're all over the place. AGL uses recycled plastic in their discs. It's it's happening, but um, I think I think we could do more. Yeah. So then my my next question is, how do you get recycled plastic? I, I guess I don't know. Do do you call up your local like you know your Denver waste management or whatever it is and be like, hey, I want some of your plastic. And can I stop yeah. by with a truck and just dump it in the dump it at my my four by four and take off? Like, how does that work? Yeah, there are a handful of complexities here. This really where it gets to is the the plastic broker world of people buying and selling plastic, virgin plastic, back in like the 70s or 80s, realized they could make money on selling recycled plastic because no one else was doing it. And so all of a sudden, all these used car salesmen started buying and selling recycled plastic. And basically, there are either local recyclers or there are brokers who you work with to get recycled plastic because you're looking for something that's as clean as possible, which means it needs to go through a recycling facility that has, you know, state of the art equipment. Um, I, I would, I wish we could just go to the landfill because <laughs> that would be, that would save costs, but well, you know, then time and the comp, the complexities of that. So, um, and then one of the problems also you deal with is just color, uh, Castaplast regrind famously wasn't super well adopted, even though it felt fantastic. And I actually have two regrind bergs that I love because it was brown. Because when you mix all the colors together, it just comes out brown. So there's a whole market that buys and sells recycled plastic that helps, you know, basically the it's kind of a trickle down. The more that market increases the more the systems and the processes and the local recycling facilities and the money invested in those um, improve as well. So that's kind of, it's, you invest at the top hoping that it builds up over time. Yeah, I can understand because like the brown plastic, as we know, there's a few colors that are just difficult to find. Greens, browns, yeah. blacks. You know, those are, yep. I, I look at drivers when and I see those for the most part and I kind of shy away from those particular colors. Yeah. I mean, you know, I know I've got a I've got a black undertaker in my bag and I sometimes depending on the time of day, I might not throw it. I'm like, eh, it's getting a little too dark. I'm not going to bother with this one. We'll just get yeah. to throw something that I, you know, that might work just as well. So, all right. So you can, ah, there's, it's ironically, it's so there are, there are two colors that are pretty easy to get in the recycling industry and that's brown and black. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of, it's a little bit of a game there, but, uh, yeah, it's it's super interesting. I mean, we've gone so far as to call injection molding companies in our state and nearby states just saying, hey, do you use this type of plastic? If you do, are you throwing it away? We'd like to buy it from you. We'd like to, you know, help you recycle it, whatever, whatever needs to happen. And then the other thing we launched earlier this year is our disc recycling program. So over the three years leading up to earlier this year, we kind of just like people started sending discs to recycle, like chewed up by their dog or just too beat up for them or cracked in half. And I was like, there are not that many people out there who have, you know, boxes of discs that they need to recycle. And over time, we just built up such a collection that I was like, okay, let's launch this thing. Let's try to launch a full blown program that we can actually recycle and stuff like that. To date, we've received well over 10,000 discs from individuals, retailers, and manufacturers that we've recycled. We're, we're actually north of the 20,000 number at this point. Today, I went to the warehouse and there were four new boxes of discs from individuals that had showed up and we offset the carbon emissions. They get a discount on our website. We'll recycle the discs. It's a really nice relationship that crazy enough, there's a lot of people who want to recycle discs out there. And if it comes to us and it still has life left in it, we won't grind it down because at the end of the day, like it doesn't do anything to take a good disc and make another good disc out of it other than waste energy. So um, we donate those to you play or local schools and whatnot. Yeah. I imagine that, that was like a, a big scenario. Sorry, Terry. I imagine a big scenario. Like I remember the first time I broke a disc, like, an old, an old Stratus. We were on spring break. I hit something on, on whatever, and it just cracked right in half. And all I thought was, all right, well, all right, and walked over to the trash can. You know, yeah. we put it in my bag and dropped it in the trash can. 
um, and it, forever to be gone. And all I think now is I could see, I, I could see a future in uh, local leagues or even kind of like what we do with our uh, ice bowls where everybody brings their broken discs. You save them yeah. throughout the year. You bring them and then your yeah. club maybe sends them to something like a trash panda to do disc recycling. That would be amazing. And clubs and retailers can get mm -hmm. a discount on their future orders with us doing that. We've we've set up the system and it's it's working well with the people who are using it. It's it's surprising that there are discs out there like this many, but there really are. And we've also identified that if a disc ends up, discs are very hard to recycle products because no one knows what's in them unless you have insider knowledge. We luckily have that now, so we're able to do it. But if a disc ends up at a recycling facility that's set up to recycle your common day-to-day -day plastics or products, rather, it likely won't get recycled. And we actually received a box from a retailer who received it from a recycler because they didn't know what to do with it. And so we've actually proven that that's the case, that recyclers don't know what to do and that plastic is going to be here long after we're gone. So we'd like to see it fly again. With that in mind, what are the legalities or stipulations when it comes to denoting a plastic type? Is where does why why don't we have to stamp a an eight or a four or a seven or whatever on the back of our plastic disc? Or why wouldn't the manufacturers? Uh, where do those legalities and 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 that reasoning come from? Yeah, I be I believe I'm going to I'm going to defer hard and say don't quote me on this to disc.law <laughs> or someone else who actually knows. However, I'll say that um my understanding is that most of those are specific to industries and there's regulations within dis within industries. For example, um children's toys. There's more regulation there than there is mm. in the disc golf disc world and so i'm not i'm not sure exactly where the lines are on that um but what's crazy is that if we did have to put the number on it we would all be putting the number seven on it because that's mm -hmm. mixed, mixed and no one would know what it is still so yeah it's still like yeah, it's still an interesting thing those the numbers are like a identification system that's relatively it, it works it's also broken so yeah because i am i am i imagine you hear we hear about this all the time and people get really excited about a uh, different blends of plastic for different like oh i've got the you know burst blend this or that that's half this plastic and half that plastic like just our whole industry is almost built lately on you know probably every single one of the halos or orbits or whatever those are could be different types a slightly different type of plastic versus however yeah that's man it well, makes we me know <laughs> we know that we know that overmolding is technically doing that so you know overmolding you're looking at two different um they might not be different plastics you might have tpu and tpu on top of each other but one might be a super low density and one might be a super high density that's i I, if it's not, then what they're telling us isn't happening. But if it is, then that's that's gyroscopic stability right there. So, um, yeah, we've seen it. Have you talked to manufacturers? Have they been open with you at all as far as like, oh, like reach out and say, hey, I have this. I have this older eagle. What type of plastic is in here? I mean, are the, are the other manufacturers cooperative with you or is it still pretty close to the chest? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's definitely still close to the chest in terms of some of the players in the game. Basically our relationship with manufacturers at this point is we work with a handful. Some were able to say, some were not able to say. Um, and then we have reached out to some who have said, Hey, we don't have any of what you're talking about. Um, I'm not going to name anyone because I'm not willing to do that. But uh, the some are open, some aren't open. We're trying to work with them. And then funny enough, you know, you do a little bit of research or you do some testing and you can find some information that's pretty helpful. So like uh, recently we started the disc recycling program and like maybe two months later, 
one of the guys at Innova did a Reddit AMA. And in the in the some of the answers to the questions, there were some answers that helped us figure out where <laughs> Pro fit into the recycling capacity, even though he wasn't answering that question. So it just it just depends. Some are open, some aren't so open. But um, you know, I, I don't mean to to spoil premium plastic, but premium plastic is basically TPU. Um, so it's it's 90% that uh, with small variation here and there. And those small variations make a big difference. So that's why Supreme and Lucid or Fusion feel so different, right? Because there there are those small differences that make a big difference. So I don't mean to say what they're doing isn't massive because they are making big differences it's just it's still the same type of plastic at the end of the day maybe you could dispel uh dispel at least one rumor that i heard more than a decade ago and maybe you can't or maybe you don't know (laughs) Uh, some someone once told me who i trusted with their with their degree of knowledge of, of plastics and injection molding somebody once told me that it was actually cheaper to make a a star or a champion that was the brand at the time uh, a star or a champion disc than a dx disc and that the due to the plastics or whatever else but it was actually cheaper but due to the strength and the marketing and and the actual strength of the the disc that that um yeah but it it was obviously it was upside down in that we were yeah. paying Interesting. Is there? I is that just some silly thing I I heard? I wouldn't. I don't. So, bottom line, I don't know. Um, Also, plastic markets are like this. They're crazy. Sure. Could that be possible? Yes. Okay. But then you're determining price not on, hey, how much is, like how much does this cost us, but how much value does this bring to the consumer too? So there's that equation. And when you break it down to like wholesale cost and you look at a wholesale cost, because that's really what the biggest players are thinking mostly with their costs, then Mm -hmm. the difference between those is so minimal that like, yeah, when you expand it out, 15 and 22 looks a lot different, but you know, eight and 11 or, (laughs) <laughs> whatever eight and ten it's it's pretty close so um could that be possible though sure yeah 100 percent. i i can't um, say for sure and again uh I, I guess this is kind of a tangent to what you're just talking about with working with the companies uh or not um what would you say is the most impressive thing that you currently see done and and, and maybe it's what you're doing with uh the work you've done but when you see i mean because you you have a totally different look when a piece of plastic comes out we're everybody's talking about the flight numbers blah blah don't even get me started flight numbers and all this other random stuff the marketing who's throwing it the company the pricing is it tour series is it special edition blah 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 you have a completely different look when you pick up a piece of plastic than most or at least the insider knowledge so with all of that, is there a, a process or, or something that, you know, happened years ago, a new benchmark, anything like that, that you're like, damn, like that's, that is, or was awesome or ahead of its time. Is there, is there anything like that? Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a handful of things. When you look at especially the last year or two on the disc manufacturing side of things, it has been the season of releases. I mean, release after release after release after release, like so many things. Some companies are doing something every single week. Um, I'm looking at it now and going, it's so saturated. Now it's even more interesting what sticks out. Um, To be honest, the things that stick out now i think there's some some cool things being done and there's some unique things in my head it's a combination like the way i look at things is manufacturing and storytelling so the the product itself is one thing but the packaging i'm super interested in how manufacturers are bringing something to market and how you know how does something rise to the fame that it does you know did uh did the 
Innova Rolo pop off because of the video that they made with Dave about it? Or did it pop off because Joseph from another round couldn't stop throwing it and all of a sudden it was all over Instagram, you know, like those are, those are super interesting things to me. I'm not making a point there, by the way, I think there's, that's hard to track. So I'm not trying to <laughs> sure. say one or the other. I'll say this. I'll, we if all I'm, know if, it was the Jeff Panis commercial that played on Disc yeah. Golf Network where yeah. they just, just kept rolling and kept rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good. So the, the one to me that sticks out, if I'm looking at one manufacturer going there, their what they did was so interesting quest advanced technologies i'm i'm Damn. all over quest i i know it's a little bit of a throwback um steve rest in peace i like have i wish he was still alive so i could meet him and just tell him how much i respect him the things he did were mind blowing if anyone's listening to this who doesn't know quest is like Turbo putt is probably the most well known that you'd know him for, but there's so many: the 10 meter brick, the T bone, the brick, the yeah. backbone, the brick, the 100 meter laser, the crossfire. Like they're crazy discs. Um, he made he made a disc that was I'm I'm not it's it's over it's right here, but I'm <laughs> not going to show it. It's going to be a video coming soon for Trash Panda, <laughs> but. Um, I'm going to do a whole video on quest, but, uh, he made a disc that is literally the same on the top and bottom. I don't remember. Yeah. Why? Okay. What are we doing? Cause it doesn't matter. The dude, the dude was not limited. Mm -hmm. His, his limit was his, where his mind could go. And it was so yeah. like, it's so cool to see the things he did. He was, if you talk to Dave McCormick at gateway, he knew him closely. Um, he knew Steve mm -hmm. closely and worked closely with him. He, he talks about that guy with such admiration too. I mean, I think what he did was insane and were some of the ideas horrible. <laughs> yeah. But like, who cares <laughs> you're trying things and that's so cool to see. So yeah, quest is the quest is the cornerstone. Oh, wow. That is uh that's it. I also I saw his operation. I visited him at his house. Uh he's in yeah, he was he's Chicago, he was in northern right? Illinois. I wanna yeah, northern yeah. Illinois. Um in a suburb I wanna say like Lake Villa, Illinois. Uh I had okay. bought this from him. Uh, you know, he he used to pull around a trailer uh with like his Saturn or something. Uh <laughs> a car that didn't seem like it really could pull this trailer full of frisbees around or he packed them in there weird yeah um yeah just an just an incredible guy and and of course the turbo putts like this meme disc you know so to speak today and for those that and, don't but, know the turbo putt looks like a gear it looks like yeah it's, it's got the knobs all around the cert all mm -hmm. around the edge that you would put your fingers between so you'd get better rotation on your on during your turbo and it has putt. a it has a spiral oh, yeah, spiral on the, rim on the bottom your thumb for your go. thumb yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, and you I can mean, adjust it to base. Yeah, I mean, what a what a horrible, beautiful idea, <laughs> right? Like that disc is yeah. such a. Why why can't we go there? Why can't we try some things? You know, like I think I think that's super cool. And um, you know, modern day, uh, there's man. I hate. I don't even want to say someone because I'm going to forget someone. But you look at um, loft discs. They're doing some really innovative things that are really cool to see. The Borium um, was was special in my opinion, even though some people don't like it. Um, the most recently, the overmolding that Clash was doing, it got mm. a lot of positive and a lot of negative. And to be honest, like if you're trying something, you're gonna get a lot of positive and a lot of negative. So more power to the people who are trying. I love it. So looking at your lineup of discs, I'm on trashpandadiscgolf.com. Um, I see the inner core and the dune. Is that is that the extent of the lineup right now? That's the oh, lineup oh, right now. Kind and, of. Kind of. And, well, there's there's the uh, there's the <laughs> illegal discs too. I'm gonna put that in quotes because those are not <laughs> yeah. PDGA approved. The those are just, you know, outside of the weight range. I think Terry's saying kind of because um Yes. What day is it? Tuesday? Yeah. Yep. Yesterday yeah. we had our, we had our third disc approved the ozone. So that'll be coming out this year. It's a fairway driver. 
Wasn't there already a disc named the Ozone? I swear to God, I have one. Like, no, I think that's a, a zone. Nope. I think you're thinking of it. <laughs> nope. I, there, was a, there was a defunct manufacturer yes. called Ozone. Oh, they made a disc was. called the, I want to say it's like Andro C or something. It's the and one they, with they the they insert. Made, yeah. Yes, I, Again, I ordered that. An innovative, that. an innovative manufacturer that tried something different. And I think it's literally like right there. <laughs> it's right here. Yeah. The, the, actually, going back to Quest, I'll just quickly say, um, Turbo Putt, Steve was pretty open about tur how Turbo Putt was really hard for him because he put it out into the world and then it got PDJ approved and then mm -hmm. pulled out of PDJ approval. And mm -hmm. the reception from the community was really hard for him. And that's, that's the one thing I want to see is I just want to see the community rally around like great ideas. Let's have fun. Let's try something new. I'm, I'm trying to think of the ones that are happening now. So my mind also went to Discraft recently doing the zone battle pack with the banger mm. and the, mm -hmm. um, oh geez, ringer zone that that's so cool. Bringing people into the process and choosing the mold, like that's the stuff that's standing out, you know? So yeah, I think, uh, seeing people innovate is really cool. I'm, I'm a fan of the future, hence sustainability. I want to see people playing disc golf in. 500 years i won't see it i want it to happen much longer than i'm here but uh i, I like innovation outside of that too so this kind of goes with what we were just talking about steve and then the turbo putt being um you know legal and then not and i think that set such an interesting precedent just for all of disc golf if you've been around long enough the, to know of that story and how that all unfolded and and kind of the, the just the process there which reminds me i've got a uh, a video I need to release about a disc getting PDGA approved, like what goes into it. We filmed the entire yeah. process happening at Masters Worlds this year. So, oh, nice. Uh, uh, yeah, it's really cool. Jeff Homburg, uh, you know, did it. Cool. He had all the tools, explained what he was doing and, and making all the, the marks and everything else for it, measurements. Uh, speaking of that innovation, I, I specifically, in, in terms of recycling, old school, I went with the Vibram polo tonight yeah <laughs> all right this is like this is more than 10 years old right this polo is 10 years old vibram of course got into the game for a little while with the rubber discs uh, very again i saw those manufactured actually i, I was at qualberg and saw vibram discs made we I put out a video for that really crazy so process quick, quick side tangent. <sighs> yeah what are your when thoughts I, when i started i of course went immediately and said, how are, how are discs made on YouTube? And there's nothing except for one video from Terry Miller. That's like, <laughs> here's, here are the quickest shots of the Vibram process. And Vibram is compression molding, not injection molding. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different process. And I'm like looking as close as I can, trying to find out how it's happening. That was a, uh, that, that's just a side <laughs> tangent I had to share, but I've, however many views that video has, I've, I'm half of them just on repeat <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on. I, I should bring it back out because, uh, again, I think some of that stuff, you know, that was a different world when I had, you know, a 10th of the subscribers and there's a lot of good, I think gems hidden out there. But anyway, yeah. when you, when you, does that excite you? I, I, of course you've been talking in plastics and, and recycling the plastics and everything you've learned about plastics. Is there a world where you're thinking, yeah, you know, Vibram is a viable solution or, or any other materials, uh, or, or yeah. are these all trade secrets you're, you're keeping under uh, patent law right now? I'm, I'm going to say something and there, every time I say this, people don't believe me and I could not mean it more. Our win is everyone else's win. I have no trade secrets. I am not trying to hide anything. I would love our trade secret is hundred percent recycled plastic. It, we're, we're shouting it from the rooftops. So really when it comes down to it, I have nothing to hide. Um, as far as other materials, so bioplastics are a conversation, which are plastics that basically um, are, are made using bio, uh, like basically corn oil, oils that are more natural oil than um, raw, I'm sorry, my words. What time is it? Seven forty-five. <laughs> this is too early for me that, to that it's be falling made, apart it, it's over It's not here. necessarily made from crude oil. It's made crude. from other oils. 
Crude is the word. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, crude was what I was looking for. So crude, it's not made from crude oils. It's made from, um, from like your vegetable or naturally occurring oil or renewable oils. Um, so bio is super interesting. A lot of people mix up bioplastic with biodegradable. The biodegradable mm -hmm. side of things has a long way to go. And it's currently in the hard plastics world. As far as when we could see a disc that could be thrown into the forest that if it was lost, would just biodegrade and it'd all be fine. We're, we're years from there, but that would be, that would be crazy one day. So bio is interesting. Um, the only time we've really seen that in disc golf was latitudes release of eco plastic, which didn't have the best reception. Uh, it was baseline. It was like a baseline com comparison, um, being a little stiffer. Some loved it. Some didn't love it. Um, so bio is interesting. Uh, Rubber is very interesting because rubber specifically Vibram is made from what's what's referred to as a non recyclable rubber. That doesn't mean it can't be recycled. For example, tracks, uh, turf fields, playgrounds, we often see like tires are also made out of a non recyclable rubber, but they can be <laughs> that means they can't be melted down, but they can be recycled. Um, I believe uh, elevation discs was doing something with recycled tires which means there may be a way to melt them down which is awesome i i don't have knowledge in that space so one day we may start looking in some of these other categories and you know trying out recycled rubber or trying out bioplastics at the moment there's still so much for us to learn i mean our learning curve is is insane <laughs> at trash panda and Every, every time we learn something, I feel like we're still at the bottom of the learning curve. <laughs> so recycled plastic is kind of the focus right now. But yeah, there's, some, there's definitely some other interesting ones out there. Uh, so I've got two mm -hmm. other questions. You now have, with the ozone, you're going to have a fairway driver, a mid-range, and a putter. With the recycled plastic, have you found that one of those styles of discs is harder to make than another? Is... I feel like you need to be more drivers in my head feel like they would require more consistency than a putter, so to speak. I feel like there's a little bit more play when you have a putter and the consistency of the, th of the throw, maybe because we're throwing it not quite as far, but do you have, yeah. is, is there a particular disc that's harder to make with, with the recycled plastic? Well, consistency is definitely harder when the wing shape is more, pronounced like a driver. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean on the injection molding side, it's harder to make, but consistency as an experience to the individual playing disc golf is definitely more obvious when you're throwing 14 speed versus one speed, right? Um, in terms of what we've learned really at this, at this point, we have the fairway driver approved. We've really made uh, the putter in mid. So at a production scale. So for me to, to speak to it, it's hard for me to speak beyond mid range, which mm -hmm. five speed specifically. Um, so as far as what we've learned in terms of is one harder than the other with recycled plastics, the, the variance between the putter and the mid range hasn't been much. And I anticipate there will be a little bit to the putter or I'm sorry, to the fairway, but not too much as well, probably a little more. Um, but the, the problem with recycled plastic comes in when you're an injection molding machine is this massive machine that's designed for consistency. Terry, earlier you talked about automation. I'm sure in your head, you're looking at robots in Sweden that are running these discs. Like it's all about automation. It's all about mm -hmm. consistency and the machine is optimized for consistency. But to do that, you have to feed a material in that is consistent. And that's where virgin plastic comes in. If you, throw that out the window and it's a hundred percent recycled all of a sudden it creates a lot of complications because that consistency is very, very complicated to achieve. So, uh, I say that I don't mean to say, Hey, making discs is harder for us. It, it is it, using recycled plastic is harder, but making discs is hard period. <laughs> so again, what manufacturers are doing is very admirable. And what it's funny you say that I think of how sometimes hypocritical our sport is with consistency in that we look at 
I'm just going to throw Innova out there with the Sex and Firebirds. Every year they come out and they fly a little different. Some people love the 2016s because they f- they're they more flippy. I don't know. Someone's going to get really mad at me because I i don't know those yeah. things. Some of them are less flippy every year. And, and people are like, well, these were the best run. I, I don't think necessarily that, you know, if I got an Ozone that was blue, that was maybe a little more flippy than a red Ozone, it's like, oh... I don't think I would have a problem with that. It's like, oh, cool, I got a more stable one, or I got yeah. a I got a little bit less stable one. The hard part, obviously, is knowing what you're going to get ahead of time. I mean, we saw we've all seen the 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 destroyer mold video that was that hit hard like two years ago, where he showed you the different bent, like the different wings and whatnot. So, yeah. do, are you worried about consistency for your? Uh, your drivers or is there oh, yeah. or, or have you found what's more consistent like oh blue ones do this red ones do this clear ones <laughs> so yeah i mean am i worried about consistency 100 percent um we're using a completely inconsistent feedstock i don't even know what i'll be using a year from now right so i i don't even have that material so in terms of consistency yes i'm concerned it was something we kind of had a little bit of foresight on early on and we put a little engraving on the bottom of the disc. It's a, it's a kind of a rotating dial that says the exact date that the disc was made. So if you have a clear inner core that was made in December of 2023, you can likely find another clear inner core made in December of 2023. And it's going to be, it's going to be from the same run, right? So we tried to create that like transparency with what run each disc was from. Um, But in terms of consistency, it really comes down to the individual (laughs) because I am such a casual player. Like I only bought discs from a used bin for 12 years. Like I I I'm with you. I don't care if this disc flies a little different than it says it will. I'm going to throw it a hundred times. I'm going to know exactly what it does. And it's going to do what I need. Whereas if I'm a pro who throws this disc, I know in the water, I need to make sure that I can grab another one. And it's going to do the same thing. So it really depends on the person. And I, I can't even begin to comprehend that. Cause I just, I <laughs> don't really care, but for that person, they can probably not comprehend my perspective, right? Well, so take any disc, go out to a wooded course, and that disc is probably walking off the course different than when you bought it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we're, we're none of us seem to be. If if we were that good at throwing, we wouldn't be doing this. We'd be on the pro tour. But you talk <laughs> about you you talk about pros. You guys just signed your first pro sponsorship. Yeah. You, you have Erica yeah. Stinchcomb now. Tell us a little bit about that process and. Working with Erica. Yeah, we're, we're absolutely stoked about it. So Erica was someone we met about a year ago, kind of just started chatting, um, had a few conversations here or there. Didn't, didn't really think much of it, but there was definitely an alignment of values. And then really, um, to our surprise, we released our baseline plastic. So our putter inner core and she, she started putting with it and putted for the duration of the pro tour since like, I think she started at OTB last year. And for the rest of the pro tour, she putted with our disc and completely like unsolicited did it on her own. It was awesome. And she decided she wanted to keep going this year. We had some conversations, honestly, pro sponsoring pros has been always one step further than we're at right now for me. And the only thing that could, bring it sooner was an alignment of values and it's there with Erica. She's from Montana. She's, she's, you know, in love with the outdoors. Sustainability is huge in her life. It, there was this alignment there and it just, it just made sense. So we were stoked to kind of bring the two brands together and see what we could do. Uh, And with Erica, first of all, congratulations to both you and her with her is that, is that going to be specific to being a quote unquote putter sponsorship? Like I've, I've seen Drew Gibson uh, go out and seek out. Is that, or do you expect her to be throwing, uh, or has she fallen in love with uh, at least the other disc? Uh, the yeah, Dune, or, yeah, yeah. Or possibly Great question. The... She is, she's obligated to throw one of our discs. That's it. There's no, there's no specific disc that she has to throw. It's really up to her. She had already chosen to putt with the inner core again this year. So she's already, 
<laughs> she's already checked that box. If she wants to throw the dune, if she wants, by the way, we, we differentiate, differentiate between the putting inner core and the throwing inner core, because again, being sponsoring pros being one step ahead to me, it was like, we've got one disc. Hey, be on our team and you have to throw at least one of our discs. Oh, by the way, you have to like <laughs> this disc. Like that's just ridiculous. Uh -huh. So, um, we kind of differentiate between the two inner core and then the dune and really it's, it's up to her. She's already checked that box. It's not something I'm really even concerned about. Again, it's a, it's the alignment of values. It's not, it's not, it's so much more than the game for the reason that we decided to partner up. No, that's, uh, that's awesome. Now with everything you've learned and continue to learn and will I don't want to say fight through, but I'm sure you're obviously adhering to PDGA tech standards. I'm, this is not a anti PDGA question at all. My question though is, is there a standard you disagree with or would love slightly altered or changed or maybe more variants, whatever that is, um, or maybe since I know what they are, but why don't you explain kind of what, first of all, what some of the tech standards are for a new disc? And then answer the question as to if there's anything you'd love to see tweaked or, or changed out of yeah. those standards. Um, the technical standards are, for those who don't know, a, a, a box and your disc has to fit somewhere inside of this box, if you will. So in terms of what they are, um, they're pretty, they're pretty open. There's not, there's not, um, too many that like, uh, are prohibitive other than like the diameter has to be smaller than this amount. And basically that means you can't make a hula hoop, which if someone was going to do that. That'd be crazy. So, um, as far as the technical standards there to me, we're innovating the, the material. We're not innovating the disc per se mm -hmm. at the moment. So I'm, I'm perfectly happy with where the technical standards are at. To be honest, I okay. think they need, they need a, uh, just from my opinion, and this is of no offense to the technical standards working group. They need, they need some actual technical people to come in and bring it into the 21st century. It's a uh, mm. very, it's very old school in how it's done. It's very manual. It's very, yeah. And they just, they just, by the way, I, I hope that they don't take that offense to that, but also if they do, here's, here's a positive I'll throw their way. It costs $300 to get a disc approved. And here's, here's the one I would like to see change. I'd like to see the price for how much it costs to get a disc approved increased. Now this year it's getting increased from three to $500. I would there like to see it get increased way more than that because you should be very serious. If you're going to get a disc approved, you shouldn't just be able to throw $500 at it for some people. 500 is a lot, but for businesses who are bringing something to market, if they're already looking at building a 20,000 plus dollar tool, $500 is n a non sequitur. So I think we're seeing so many people come into it and so many discs that are doing some of the same things. In, in my opinion, what I would like to see is just a higher bar for people to jump over so that if you really are serious about it, go for it. That's interesting. Well, yeah. I, I was going to follow that up not, with do you not like sexy thing to say too? like not. a. Oh, it's a hot. A, it's a hot take here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a, <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Does is that then rooted also in your mission of, well, maybe that would weed out a few of these people who, like you said, maybe aren't serious, but also that's just that so much less plastic that's probably going to get wasted because they are taking it more serious because it does cost more. Do you feel like that might like just weed out some of the, mm. the, the wasted, um, I think you know, the, failed endeavors. I think the amount of plastic is going to be determined by the market at the end of the day. So if the market blows up the, the whether there's three manufacturers or 300, ultimately those three manufacturers will scale to meet the market demand. So I think that discs, the amount of discs are going to be out there to me. It just weeds out people who like, we don't need more noise by people who just aren't as serious about it. And I am 
there's no one in my head, by the way, who I'm thinking of. And I could not be more serious about that. I'm not, you're thinking not thinking of, of yourself. Uh, you're I'm, not thinking of yourself three years ago. That was like, man, I'm not paying those a-holes a thousand dollars to send them my Frisbee. I mean, would you I have been excited about I, that? When I first saw it, I thought $300 is nothing for me to, huh. for the amount of time I put, it took us two and a half years to get our first disc to market. I put so much blood, sweat, and tear and thousands of dollars into this thing. 300, I was fine spending that. Oh, by the way, your first year you get half off. So it was $150. So <laughs> I was, I was fine with it as far okay. as I, it doesn't need to change. It, it, it doesn't, it's not going to mean it's not going to make or break the future of the sport. To me, it's just one of those things that the PDGA could charge a little more and then they could, they could be bringing in, you know, much more high tech equipment to do these approvals, to innovate the sport. The money could be going to build things and tools and different things to really innovate the sport, um, or standardize things like flight numbers. And then, you know, you'd have people who are more serious about it. So I, I just think raise the price a little bit. By the way, I'm not thinking of my bottom line here because I'm happy with a lower price. But uh, yeah, it's... Well, and okay, I think... So like, I, I think something like that, and I haven't thought enough about it to know whether I agree or disagree with it, but what I can imagine is we don't need to have every disc PDGA approved. Like you have it yourself, your elite, your illegal discs are too heavy or too whatever. But if play pretend the because we mentioned it earlier, the Rolo. If if Innova was just like, cool, we're gonna make a fun disc. This is a Rolo. You don't have to throw it at. You can't throw it at PDGA events. Um, it's just kind of a frisbee or whatever you want to call yeah. it. It's a disc. Yeah. Any casual can still go and play. You said yourself, you played twelve years without ever playing a sanctioned event. Like what's you know, I I don't yeah, necessarily think great. we need to have every single disc that's molded PDGA approved and maybe increasing that price could do something like that. I, I don't necessarily know if I'm for or against that, but it's an, it's definitely an interesting take. I too have not thought enough about the repercussions. <laughs> so I just threw it out there and am now am now circling in my brain. Oh, uh, it's forever on the internet uh, now. No, you did yeah. it. Uh, the, <laughs> no. So, I'm happy you said that because it made me think of two discs. One is there was the original Ninja from Gateway, which had mm -hmm. too wide of a rim and was thus not never PDGA approved. And they stamped on it, not intended for PDGA play. And that's a super interesting disc. Um, th then modern day, uh, you have, I, I didn't mention them and I'm happy you brought it up because it made me think of them, Doomsday discs they're doing some really interesting things. You might've heard of the landmine, which is like a mm. pole cat to the 10th degree with super extreme lid. Um, but they also have a disc called the weapon of mass destruction. I think, um, don't quote me on this, but that's also a disc that's too wide, not intended for PDGA play, never approved, but you can throw it so far with so much ease. <laughs> and then, they also have like a, a condor diameter, like T-Bird, Thunderbird-esque disc, which is crazy. And so it's super mm -hmm. cool. I like seeing, I like seeing different stuff. I think that's cool. So shout out to them too. That's, that one's interesting. Again, I don't, we know you're not going to name any names. You're going to, you're not going to give us that much, but. <laughs> How often, maybe here's how I'll word it, how often, if ever, do you just roll your eyes or throw your hands up or slam your desk in disgust when you see some of the marketing and or ploys that you just you just know are are BS? Or or do we not have a lot of that in our in our sport? I mean, again, you have such an insider different unique perspective now and you're coming in with so many other established i mean do you do you see something posted and you're just like oh my like that's so do you ever get that i are you too positive for that i'm like i'm definitely optimistic to a fault and i think that to me it's just 
I, I don't know. Some people, the, if I, sometimes I'll see things and if, if I saw myself do them, I would roll my eyes all day. But the reality is that we see the world from different perspectives. And so, you know, I believe, I believe that we can all grow this pie together. And there's like this, this Harvard business review article that was about pie enlargers versus pie slicers. And some people believe that for me to grow my slice of the pie, I have to actually take some of your slice. And then there's some people who believe that we can just grow the pie. We can keep our slices. And if we work together to grow the pie, all of our slices grow bigger. It's a business mm -hmm. analogy, but I, I see the world that way. And I, I think we can work together to be honest. Sustainability is that way. It's, it's, we say this sometimes it's not about one per, it's not about someone doing everything, but rather everyone doing something to us. Mm -hmm. That's like a hugely important piece of it. It's not about trash Panda. It's about all of us doing something. And so when I look at people, when I see things, I have a hard time rolling my eyes because they just see the world differently than I do. And that's okay. Um, so that's my, I don't know. That's my non-answer, but that's just, that's just how I am. Well, let me, let me, again, I'm going to go, this digs way back to, as Johnny mentioned earlier, uh, echo plastic from, uh, or eco plastic from Innova. Oh. Someone once said to me, again, I always, here's my disclaimer. Someone once said to me, yeah, that's great. They're doing it. The full color sticker that they're putting on that disc to to differentiate it and to tell you that it's eco plastic or whatever is doing more damage than probably what they're doing to recycle it in the first place. And that was an interesting take. I have no idea, of course, if that was true, but just a, I'll say a naysayer had said that to me. And I, it, it really was interesting because that's where you're like, you're blending the the practicality of some form of recycling, but then the marketing that goes with it. And is that, you know, so to speak offsetting in any capacity? Um, I just, yeah. I thought that was a really uh, interesting way that I heard that said yeah. way back when uh, Eco Plastic came out. I feel like you could say that about anything though, almost like, Oh, the, 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 you know, the amount of electricity you're using to run the presses to redo these discs is, you know, is hurtful for the environment or, you know, the the, the, the extra gas it takes to drive now the, these additional discs. I feel like you could find a naysayer with almost any aspect. And I, I'm kind of with Jesse, what he said earlier is it's just like, it's nice to see people trying these things, whether yeah. you, you can, you can pick apart anything. The, That's what I'm here for. I, I've, up. I've got... Yeah, I've got two thoughts on that. Well, I've got three. First is retitle the episode to Terry tries to get Jesse to call someone out because <laughs> yeah. welcome, that's what's going on here. Box. I won't do box. it. <laughs> I, don't, um, I really don't want I'm you totally to. Joking. I'm not I'm asking totally for joking. that. <laughs> I'm totally joking. The, so my, my two thoughts with this are um, on, on the one hand, uh, I, I think, well, I have, I have one primary thought here and it's that we live in, we live in a world that is at an all time high when it comes to accountability. Um, the customer and the consumer cares people, people actually care. And so what are you doing? Be honest about it. Be truthful about it. Be transparent and like try to do better. Our whole thing is like, do something and then like maybe do something else after that. And then maybe after that, you choose to do something else, but it's not about doing everything at the beginning. Uh, so we always recommend if people are like, what can we do? My, my top recommendation next time you're out playing disc golf, pick up one piece of trash. And then the next time you're out playing disc golf, maybe you consider picking, picking up one piece of trash. And then maybe that becomes a habit and you start picking up two pieces. And then maybe you choose to do something else. To me, it's like, it's, we get so paralyzed by needing to do it all when mm -hmm. it, it stops us from taking the first step. And then what becomes important is what's after that. Um, on the accountability note, I will mention something else that is a huge point of pride for us. And that's that being that things are at an all time high with accountability, we, we try our best to be as transparent and as accountable as possible. But I can sit here and make a YouTube video and tell you how great we are all day. 
it's different for someone else to come in and audit. And so earlier this year, sorry, earlier last year, can't believe it's already 2024. <laughs> um, we started the process of going through the uh, rigorous assessment that is the B impact assessment to become a certified B Corp. And not everyone's familiar with what a certified B Corp is, but basically there's a company that has the certification that it's set up to be a third party that comes in, hosts this super rigorous assessment that can take anywhere from, I think they say six to 18 months. And they go in and audit the entirety of your company and make sure you adhere to the highest social, ethical, and environmental standards. Mm -hmm. And B Corp is super cool. You might've seen it from companies like Patagonia or Ben and Jerry's. It's, it's surprisingly all over the place. So if you find the logo and you start looking for it, you'll see it. But that was something we pursued earlier this past year. And in September, we actually received our certification. And so Trash Man became the first ever, ever disc golf company to become a certified B Corp. And we are incredibly proud of that. So it's, it's to me, it's like the question of there, there's, it's twofold. The electricity that we're using to make discs don't get paralyzed by it. But then also I want to do something about that. We out of pocket offset every single sh shipped box from our warehouse any shipping that goes out from our warehouse we're offsetting and when we chose to do that we actually went back and retroactively did it for anything we've ever shipped and that's like it's a belief for us and it's our step and then our next step and we don't in any way want it to seem like your steps should be those things too it's just about everyone choosing to do something so <laughs> Making discs, and I don't don't roll your eyes at this. In concept, is relatively easy. It's one piece. It's an injection mold of one piece. Have you looked at anything else in the disc golf market and thought we can do something about that? Whether it's a bag inserts, whether it's umbrella holders, like I just think of these little pieces of plastic stools, stools, like. But I think of a yeah, bag like, themselves. Yeah, exactly. What I, I think of like a a an umbrella holder that I that I put on the handle of my cart. It's it's a couple different pieces. It requires something you usually screw together and it puts in that's what I'm saying, like multiple pieces, probably more molds, more, you know, all these other things as opposed to a disc, which is a single more or less a single piece of plastic out of your molder. I know there's more to yeah. discs than the it's the simplification that I'm giving it, but have you looked at other things in the industry and thought maybe we can do some of that? Uh, it is, it is so hard not to just be like, let's make this, let's make this, let's try that because there are a lot of different things. Um, we just, again, going back to our learning curve and where it's at, it's so high. We still have so much yet to learn that as, as the person leading the charge at Trash Panda, I'm choosing to make sure that our team is laser focused on the task at hand, which is learning how to make discs. So once we've learned how to make discs and we feel like we can do, we can replicate this and we can continue to expand the lineup, do we expand to other products? Potentially. Um, the one, the one, there was one caveat <laughs> to that though. And that was my very first sponsorship I ever took on YouTube was, um, a free product trade for highlighting in a video with a company called disc dot. They were a brand new putting aid that you've probably heard of. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. over the years we continued a relationship. And then last year they came to me and asked if we could be their manufacturer. And so actually we are currently the ones who make disc dots and disc dots now are all made out of recycled discs. So we chose to this dot almost feels like similar to Erica in the sense that it was like it, new products are always a step ahead of where we're at, but the value and the relationship alignment was just, we couldn't turn our backs on that. So we're stoked to be the ones making disc dots. So we do make one product outside of, um, outside of discs. And then I guess, I mean, minis as minis. well. I mean, yeah. the fact that the fact that anyone is making minis out of virgin plastic is mind blowing to me <laughs> because the only thing you get out of that is automation. Um, TPU is also just a complex and complicated plastic to run. The fact that 
you can make a mini out of anything. It doesn't have to perform whatsoever. So it is quite interesting that um, minis are being made with virgin plastic. I think I think recycled plastic on the mini side of things for manufacturers, especially, you know, why not take your waste, grind it up, make minis? It seems very, very possible. So. Uh, yeah, I was just looking. Uh, I have worked with uh, Zing Mini, and uh, one of the cool innovations that I feel like they have come out with is their Flapjack Mini, and it's yes. you know standard, so to speak, standard mini size, but it's very flat. And I don't know how much yeah. less plastic he's using. I've got to assume it's a it's you know some degree, and yeah. it's a hundred percent functional. In fact, it's it's quickly becoming like one of my favorite. Uh, concepts for a mini because it's so minimal oh and and craig, it, it's craig great is a, craig is a fantastic guy owner of zing um good friend i'm a huge fan of his the flapjack is i mean if that's not the future of minis i don't know what is you can literally put it in your pocket and it doesn't make this massive indent in your pants it's like it's uh -huh. very simple and smooth and it's i mean it's fantastic so yeah the 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 i mean the flapjack is a awesome mini yeah there we go yeah. i don't know if i'll be able to get it into uh into but here's here's three of them stacked or four of them <laughs> sorry four of them stacked and just the fact that they uh you know i don't think it's gonna focus probably anyway, the size uh, of a normal uh, mini yeah. yeah yeah it's about the size of a normal mini and uh i just i absolutely love those uh, as i was just introduced to them recently when he did some for me so anyway yeah. uh you know as you said jesse we could we could probably you know have a, a nine hour podcast with you with so many incredible uh questions and answers and, and developments and thoughts that you've had uh so that means we're gonna have to have you back <laughs> we can't break all our records in terms of length of podcast but what i'm getting at is you too have your own podcast or have, have hosted 12 episodes are people expecting to see more of that uh or, or download more of that what's kind of the plan there what have you been doing podcast is a question mark at the moment so okay. i uh, we're we're in a little bit of a limbo right now with uh yeah we had a podcast called patent pending with jomez mm -hmm. and i am so biased and a big fan so uh, it's it's a cool show if you like podcasts, interesting stories in the sport. Um, but it's kind of in limbo right now, and we're not sure um, okay. just because there's a lot of fluctuation going on in uh, all three brands that are now part of it with the Pro <laughs> Tour coming into the Jomez scene. So there's a lot okay. happening. Okay. We'll we'll see if it comes back. Um, but yeah, it would it it it's a fun one. I I have a blast making them. So. Yeah. Well, there there are twelve of them out there, so people can still go consume them and take them in. And as you're saying, maybe uh, we'll see if additional ones get made. But you do have twelve episodes that are all listed uh, out there as well. So make sure you guys check yeah. that out. Uh, Jesse, is there uh, any any parting shots or final thoughts that you have for us before we let you go here tonight? No, I again we're. Every time we learn something, we just learn what we don't know. So if <laughs> if you want to if you want to schedule a time to get back on and talk about all the things I still don't know, I would love to. <laughs> you can try to get me to call people out again. We'll we'll do this. <laughs> you know, we'll get it recurring. So it was a pleasure to come on and hang out with you guys. I I'm a huge fan of what you're both doing. It's like um, one of the things with patent pending specifically. The show that we did was just like being able to talk to people who changed the game and being someone who's just been a fan of disc golf and been someone playing for um, over 15 years now, to me, it's like, I, I just have such admiration and gratitude to the people who are building this sport and who keep it going. What did you say? 488? Yeah. Yeah. Or 488. Podcast 488. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah. Do people tell you that's amazing every time? Because if not, uh, no, that's insane. <laughs> uh, well, that's awesome. There, there's some so, longevity yeah. there. Yeah, we appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. No, it was an honor. All right. to come on and thank you guys. <laughs> thank you for well, everything you're yeah. doing. Honestly, the, what with what yeah. you're doing in the sport, um, you're bringing attention to I think a much needed aspect that a lot of times nobody really thought of. I mean, like I said, we we have kind of 
dipped her toe into it in the past, but doing something like what you're doing is is amazing for the sport. I truly believe that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I know uh, some of the people that you work with, I've seen uh, some of this progression throughout the years, and it's it's truly inspiring. And if anything, we have to name this podcast to, you know, why Terry and Johnny can't live up to Jesse's standards here and all the good <laughs> He makes us feel shitty because okay. he's such a good guy and does, does so many things. Uh, I'm, okay. we're I'm just glad well, there's people we, like that out we there. We missed we missed the message. The message was we all do something. Yeah, no, it's no. Thank you guys. Thank you very uh, much. Seriously, Jesse. keep it up. It's uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure to watch this, as we've said. And uh, clearly, we 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 should just like schedule you and assume you're going to be on every so many episodes, uh, so we can check <laughs> in with everything you got going on. Uh, and you're welcome here anytime. So appreciate it, and have a good night, and have a good uh, you know start of the new year. And we'll look forward to seeing you out on the course or uh, on the road somewhere at some point. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot, Jesse. All right, see ya. All right, take care. All right. What a phenomenal human. And again, I know a few of the people that are working over there. And then, he, as he said, teaming up with the likes of Erica and others. Uh, w- this community that he has built uh, is is passionate and enthusiastic and emphatic as they should be. And uh, I, I thank him, but then also all of the community that surrounds him because they're making up for the slack that you and I don't necessarily uh, put out on any given day there, Johnny. No, so for sure. We're, we, I, I like to think of ideas and make other people do them. Um, that's my, <laughs> that's my favorite thing. No. And I was just thinking like when I mentioned the ice bowl, that's probably coming up for a lot of people or the big freeze, big chill, whatever you want to call your, your local area. All I think is imagine for all the discs that are cracked, that can't be thrown, just don't throw them away, keep them. And then yeah. one reach out to a local tournament director and just say, Hey, everyone drop your discs off at this event this year and send it and find a way to send them over to Jesse at trash Panda. Um, yeah, it, it's so much better than, as we said, you can't, re- the recycling companies don't, won't take them. Throwing them away seems wasteful now. Like I wouldn't have said that five years ago. Now that you know that there is a company out there that will that will take your broken, beat up, chewed up plastic that is still throwable, or maybe not throwable anymore, and do that. If it's still throwable yeah. and you don't want it, obviously, like we said, donate it to somewhere. Get, donate it to a local boys and girls club. Send it to you play. F- figure something like that out. There's plenty of places for that. But for those discs that are truly just like, oh, this cannot be thrown anymore. Um. There, there, we we have options now, and I'm really yeah. really happy to hear that. Yeah, and he he answered the question before I even had a chance to ask it as to like when those get donated, you know, what if they still have life left in them? Basically, because I think of a place, you know, whether it's uh, the crew of people we know going over to to Africa right now, or going over to Thailand, or really anywhere, and like you said, even more locally, there's always a place where old beat up discs can be so valuable to some communities, even if they are, you know, just that beat up, but if they're beat up to the point where they're, you know, uh, you know, a- almost just barely hanging together, then yes, getting them sent over to, uh, Jesse and the crew at trash Panda seems like it makes the most sense so they can do something good with them. Well, all right. We do have another guest tonight, Terry. What? Another one already? We do. We have someone in our Disc Baron Digital Green Room. Is it still the Disc Baron Digital Green Room? If it's it not, it's fine. It certainly is. It's, uh, I'll, it, I'll it say is it to anyway. me. It'll always be All right. Now. Well, he, here's a little bit of a preface to it. Uh, just, je- just like Jesse being a first-time guest, uh, we're going to have another first-time guest. And he had he heeded our advice, believe it or not. <laughs> Maybe that's his first mistake. Uh, he, he said, I hear you guys talking about the opportunity for professionals or players to mention their new sponsorship and their new sponsorship alignments. And I have a brand new sponsorship alignment and I'd love to make it a Smashbox exclusive. So here's what, so here's what we're going to need to do. Um, he was on our, he was on. And then our good friend, Jesse jumped back on the video call. And oh, kicked, Jesse stop and kicked it. him off. So we're going to have to have Jesse Ouch. close out of this browser. If you want to listen, Jesse, you can find us on YouTube. <laughs> Um, and then we'll have our other guest <laughs> reload his page so he can get back uh, I onto the call. I should have given him a new number. Should have given yeah, him a that's... different number, Terry, because sometimes our guests yeah. do just hang out behind the scenes and watch live. 
Yeah, so Jesse's got to hang up, and then yeah. uh, once he clicks on that, then uh, our other guest will be able to jump in on the yep, call. He can just yeah, he'll refresh the browser and then he'll uh, he'll hop on the call. Uh, there. Yeah, hit refresh on your. There he uh, is. He's uh, back. Yeah. <laughs> our our guest is back. Sorry about that. Um, Jesse Jesse stole. He wanted he wanted to come back. He wanted to make talk. He wanted to call some. He people wanted to out recycle finally. his appearance. He wanted to recycle <laughs> his appearance or something. Jeez. All right. With that, uh, we have a brand new first time guest as well joining us from the Pacific Northwest. We have Kirby Schneider joining us. Kirby, how you doing, man? Good. How are you guys doing? Thanks for thanks for having me on. Oh, phenomenal! We, thanks a lot for thanks for yeah. joining us tonight. Yeah, we are doing good. And uh, I was you're, just saying, you're from the Pacific Northwest, but you got a Boston Red Sox behind you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> mm, yeah. I'm investigative a Red Sox fan. Johnny. Um, yeah, naturally born and bred in the East Coast, so uh, you know Red Sox fan through and through for sure. All right, I'll, I'll forgive you if you were born and bred there, and just now, all right, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll be oh, all yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, that my family's sense. originally from like Buff the Buffalo area, so they're getting like way worse weather than I'm getting out here. Like I heard you guys <laughs> talking about like the big freeze and like Seattle was like yeah. <laughs> cold and windy today, but all in all, like it was pretty all right actually. Yeah, not too bad. Well, good. Hopefully, uh, yeah, you're not experiencing the nastiness that we have. So, like Jesse, your first time guest here on the show. Uh, and before we get to some of your big news and and the exciting stuff you got going on, give us just a little bit of background in and history and uh, introduce yourself to the world. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, um, my name is Kirby Snyder, and I live here in Seattle. Um, I'm currently one of the owners of Emerald City Discs, uh, one of the pro shops here in Seattle. Um, I own it with my business partner, Brian. Um, so that's really, really, you know, we love that. We have, a, you know, about 30, 35 people between like our pro team and our AM team, um, which is our, the AM team's called box, our box squad. Um, so that's always really fun. Brian, uh, my business partner, owns a fried chicken restaurant in Seattle called Baka Bok. So that's kind of where all that kind of like stems from, at least. Um, you know, I started playing in like 2009. I went to culinary school in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And we would drive over to like Borderland State Park pretty regularly and we would go and like play out there. And that was really like the first time we learned how to like play or just like, you know, throw Frisbees in the park. And, um, you know, instantly it was something that like I love to do. Um, and then I moved out to the West Coast and uh, just had a product of like not knowing people and stuff like that out here. I just started disc golfing more and more and uh, kind of got myself like into the community a little bit. And then, you know, COVID kind of like shut the world down. Um, I was a chef at the time and my wife now and I decided that uh, it was best to like kind of get me out of restaurants for a little bit. And I just started like disc golfing and, you know, like coaching and stuff like that. And the next thing I know, like we're opening up Emerald City Discs and, you know, now I'm like over a thousand rated and like I'm just disc golfing like every weekend of the year kind of thing. So it's been um, amazing and I feel like really honored, you know, to be like doing this with like as a career right now. So, um, yeah. So, all right. So, there's no current plan to go back into the kitchen. Not, 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 not at the moment. No. <laughs> I, 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 and it's it's really fun. Last night, I didn't. I don't know if you you watched or not. My wife and I just started watching the TV series called The Bear, which is all about a gentleman. Yeah. Oof. It. Yeah. That I've only seen season one, and like, there's been a few episodes that like my wife and I will watch it. I'm like, honey, like. I think I'm done for the night. Like I'm kind of getting like <laughs> like flashbacks. Yeah, you know? so. yeah. We're, we're I think we're three episodes into the first season, maybe four. It's it's hard to tell. Those they're they're pretty quick, but they are relatively intense. And I'm I'm a big fan in general of cooking shows. We watch Top Chef, all that other fun stuff. So it's it's all I can do to sit and I just quiz you about being a chef when you're here for disc golf. So uh, that that's uh, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, my wife loves uh, the fact that she has like a, a private at home chef now. So, <laughs> I'm uh, many yeah, many wives uh, would like that. Yeah, <laughs> She's I would very say lucky. so. Uh, now, earlier in the show, we said too that when you get a job in disc golf, that doesn't mean you just get to play disc golf all day. But unless you're a top professional, perhaps where where is your dare I call it work life balance? What what does playing and practicing golf look like for you versus time in the shop or or doing other things related to disc golf um you know it depends on like the week you know some weeks where i'm like loaded with what with lessons and that you know practice is kind of scarce and you know it's more about finding time to putt and that kind of thing um i'm always like throwing during my lessons like with my clients and stuff like that so um 
as far as like you know field work stuff i kind of like do that regularly out there with them and that kind of thing um and then i always set myself up with like one day that i can go to the course and practice whether that be like a wednesday or a thursday or something but you know whatever tournament i have coming on the weekend you know like one day to get out there and get like a round or two in um you know just to get familiar with the course kind of figure out what shots and what discs and that kind of thing what has your in uh career consisted of in terms of where you're playing like or what are you seeking out is the pro tour you know g- getting on the pro tour ultimately a goal what what, what are you kind of looking at in that regard yeah i mean currently i'm um super happy with like what i have going on like what i'm doing um i definitely am aspiring to be on the pro tour to some extent um, it definitely is a disappointment that the Pro Tour isn't playing more West Coast events because those are a lot easier for me to get out to. Mm-hmm. You know, so I've played the Portland Open the last few years. Last year, I played Cascade Challenge. Um, this year, Beaver State Fling will be on my list for sure. So those, you know, without a doubt, when it comes to this area, I'll be, you know, jumping onto. But we have a really, really good local scene in the area. You know, we have um, young local players like Carter Aarons, who jumps on the Pro Tour a lot. Like, he's he lives locally here. Um, the AM World Champion, Axel Olsen, who's just an amazing player. I've been playing with him for years since he's been in AM1. Like, that kid's gonna go really far and be really really good you know and then we have some like old pros like i don't mean to say like old but like you know like kyle crabtree like guys that have been around the scene for like a really long time even guys that you might not know about like kenny clark who's um like incredible so we have a really really good like local competitive scene that uh is is really strong and and really fun to compete in yeah and speaking of competing i was looking uh per the pdga you have 27 wins. You've played in 116 events. So that's, yeah. you know, almost a 25% win ratio uh, in terms of events that you entered. And it looks like you picked up a number of wins this year. Uh, yeah, what, what's, going, what's going right for you? I mean, what, what's your strong suit when you're out there? Because as I'm looking, you picked up like six or seven or maybe even eight wins, uh, you know, between uh, C and B tiers. So where, where's your strong uh, yeah, suit? What's, just, what's your game all about? I, I think it's just like consistent play. Um, you know, I, I like, you know, trying to disc down on a lot of stuff. So that's definitely kind of my strong suit is like wanting to throw putters and like mids off the tee more than trying to bust out like my fairway drivers and stuff like that consistently. Um, but yeah, I think just more more than anything is just like getting out there and like being consistent and playing regularly like i love playing events which is why i play so many events like year after year i think for the last like two or three years i've played like over 30 events per year and it's just i just naturally enjoy like look i love getting out i love playing i love competing you know when i was a chef it was all about like putting the hours in and like kind of like grinding at the workspace and like for me like i take that same mentality into disc golf where it's just like i i'm I'm willing to put the hours into putting and you know field work and lessons and putting the hours at the shop like all of it together is like just it, it feels it's it's rewarding because it doesn't necessarily feel like work because I love what I'm doing, you know. Uh, yes, I, I do know. <laughs> and um, eventually, the hours start to add up, and then um, it, and it, you're exactly right that it doesn't feel as maybe taxing um, because you enjoy it so much, and and hopefully that uh, you know mentality forever stays. When you're looking at a schedule in say 2024, you said some of the events that you want to play. What what excites you most about playing? um in 2024 uh, and we'll get to your sponsorship announcement but like what are some of the things that excite you most about playing um you know i set a goal out for myself for 2024 that i was going to go to pdg worlds and i was going to like throw everything i had into doing that so um everything i've done this off season like i've been like going to the gym and like working out regularly and i've been like throwing like a ton of putts to the shop kind of getting like my new bag kind of like in gear and ready to go and that kind of thing and i'm doing it all with the mentality of being like okay like lynchburg let's go you know and it's like that like so i'm really motivated and driven like to that and like i don't know like what that is going to look like or what that means for myself like when i get there but all i know is like i'm gonna get there and i'm gonna give it my best shot and you know see what happens so uh so what are you know you just talked about getting your bag prepped and and gearing up and switching over what what have you been throwing what you know where's your your career been in terms of any alignments, sponsorships, things like that, kind of what's what's been uh, your game plan or you know the 
the method so far, the methodology up until this point? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, there to my bag has just kind of been whatever is, uh, you know, felt good and it's like flown well for myself. Um, the last two years I've been sponsored by loft discs and it's, they've been just like amazing to me. Um, I was their highest rated pro for the last two years. And I mean, the Xenon that they have is like an amazing disc. I kind of joke that I was the highest or the, uh, the best hydrogen thrower in the world, but I might've been like <laughs> the only pro hydrogen thrower too. So, um, well, still whatever. Counts. Yeah, still no, counts. It's all marketing. Still counts. Yeah, it's it's like, all marketing. Yeah. It's like, uh, if you're the only child, you're still the favorite child, you know? So, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but you know, I had like destroyers in my bag. Like I had like a Zeus, okay. like zones, like pretty like, basic stuff you know i was really known for throwing this uh this green luna that i would throw a lot like that was kind of like my go-to disc before mm. um the hydrogen came in my bag and then i was just throwing the hydrogen like all over the place like i i love that thing okay so you've mentioned loft obviously uh di you've mentioned some discraft some innova with all that being said how adamant or active were you in getting a sponsorship or, or possibly changing sponsorship, or was it a matter of someone uh, eventually reaching out to you? Um, and, you know, every off season I do the same thing where it's like, I'm going to reach out to as many companies as I can, you know, same reason, honestly, why I got on this podcast tonight is I just, I shot you a message and said, Hey, like, I would love to do this. I'm interested, you know, can we, you know, is this possible kind of thing? And, uh, you know, I find in disc golf, the more you kind of just like ask and, you know, shoot some messages, the more, like people are willing to kind of like talk to you and kind of give you opportunities that you might not have gotten, you know, had you not spoke, spoken up or, you know, said something. So, um, you know, I, I was a big on that and good get around and kind of see like what offers were available. Um, I did get a handful of like different sponsorship offers, a lot of which I didn't think kind of valued me as a professional player and, you know, like the value that I see in myself, like as a, as a store owner and like that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, one of the biggest like things going into the off season was to not sign a contract that's, you know, I'm not worth or whatever. And I was like more than willing to go back to loft too. Like I love those guys. Like it was a really mm -hmm. tough decision actually to step away. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah. So, well, and it okay. sounds like you, so my it sounds like you've got a lot of people who are in your corner. I'm looking at the chat and <laughs> uh, no, truly like it's, it's yeah, good to I see. Know. There's a lot of people from the Pacific Northwest here that are, that are calling out like great TD, great person, great teacher, great store owner. Like it's, it's nice to see. Well, those are his wife. Good cook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's got four accounts, and she's just like, yeah, which well, one now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, line in a room. I'm, yeah. It's. Um, it's. It's. I. I honestly really do love to see that when when we bring somebody yeah. on, and there is a group of people that that will that takes the time to show their support. It means that you yeah. really are a, the real deal, so to speak, as far as. Uh, a human. I, I I know nothing about your game, but based on what uh, everyone says here, I I could I would come to you for lessons. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I, I appreciate so my, that. And yeah, thank you to everybody in the chat. That's awesome. You know, especially to the box squad. I know you guys are in there. Thank you so much. Nice. Uh, so my last question before you make your announcement is: uh, being a store owner, and I I know a handful of store owners. I also sell a lot of discs uh, and have throughout the years, and was sponsored by various manufacturers. Does that put any awkward or weird uh sense or obligations on you you know you may be sponsored by x but you're selling you know a b c d e f at your store often it is was was any of that um negotiated or talked about or concerned in terms of kind of the different hats that you wear uh not necessarily um you know, I think with anything else, like it's a business, you know what I mean? And I think that's mm -hmm. like kind of the core of it. Um, honestly, like my big thing with like at Emerald City, like when people come in and they're looking for stuff, I'm not necessarily trying to like sell them a disc so much as I'm trying to help them find the disc that they're, they want to buy. You know what I mean? Like I'm not out there mm -hmm. really to be like pushing certain brands. Like, yes, like if somebody asks me like what I'm throwing, I'm going to be like, yeah, I'm throwing this and that, you know, and oh, I really like this. Like, oh, if you like that, but you're looking for a new version of this, you know, I might recommend this kind of thing, right? Like just like that kind of stuff. But if someone comes in and they say like, Hey, I want a destroyer. I'm not going to try to push them off of a destroyer. You know what I mean? Like that kind okay. of thing. So yeah. Awesome. Well, I don't know how many times we get to say this, but for the first time ever, uh, a, a sponsorship 
announcement, an ex- Smashbox exclusive sponsorship announcement coming from one Kirby Snyder. Let's hear it. Uh, yeah, so for the 2024 season, I will represent uh, Dismania Discs. Wow. So really looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, thank you Damn, to Avery nice. Jenkins um, for all the, the support and for believing me for next year. And uh, really excited to get out there and rep the brand. And what's Heck yeah. a, a, I, I forgive me because I don't necessarily know the Discmania tour levels and stuff. Like, are you on a specific team on Discmania? What, what, what does it entail? Uh, I'm on a pretty low level right now. Um, I see it as just me getting my foot in the door and being able to kind of grow within the company from there kind of thing. Um, you know, I got into it with uh, like a, a Dismania Combine, actually. I don't know if you guys have heard yeah. of them doing those. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I, I, yeah. I drove up to BC in Canada, which is like two and a half hours north of here. And uh, when it did a combine, it did horribly for that day. Just a bad day of throwing <laughs> out of myself. But, uh, you know, chatting with Avery and he, you know, kind of called me like a week later and was just like, you know, I see your potential. And, you know, like I said, like me owning a store, you know, definitely helps. So, um, yeah, my deal with this mania is amazing. Um, I'm really excited about it. Not only does it help myself, but it does kind of offer some benefits to the shop as well. Um, so even if yeah. I necessarily am not getting as much, the store all in all, you know, it all benefits us like as a whole. So. So you can spill the wow. tea on who Discmania is signing. Awesome. Let's get you kicked oh, I, off the team right away. Yeah, yeah tell us. Yeah, tell I us. Wish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and maybe more importantly, as I just... Smashbox. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs> as I just said in the chat, they clearly, that's why they were okay with letting Eagle go, because they had to make room for you in your contract. So um, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Kirby's no, going to be huge I mean, in Europe. Totally it. Yeah, you know, it's the, uh, instead of the crushed boys, because I'm 33, it's the crushed men now. So let's go. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, what is your strong suit? Uh, you said earlier uh, your consistency, but when you, when I think about just like uh, the actual throws, uh, putting, is it your putting that's phenomenal? Is it your, your driving? Do you have big distance? average distance like what how would you kind of rate your game in those ways um I, you know right-handed backhanded thrower i'm really good at like turnovers and like that kind of stuff um okay. i would say like for like pro tour i have like less less like i have less than max distance for the pro tour but for like our local okay. scene like I'm a, I'm a far thrower um there's guys like okay. we have you know kids like carter aarons around here who i mean that kid throws a mile so it's like Mm -hmm. Yes, I throw far, but like that kid throws like really, really far, you know, like that kind of thing. So, um, you know, when people ask me like, how far do I throw? I like to consistently say like 425 accurately, and then I can push it Mm -hmm. more if I need to. But realistically, you know, 425 pretty accurately is like where I'm at, like distance wise. Um, I like throwing my putters a lot. Like I, you know, being sponsored by Dismania now, I got to bust out this old Sky God 2 and I'm throwing that Mm -hmm. thing maybe like 350 or so right now, like really, really straight with like a little bit of turn to it and like that's like kind of where I like my game to be at is when I can get those putters like straight flat and kind of like riding kind of thing. Very cool. And then how about forehands, rollers, uh, overhands? Is there any, anything that stands out uh, in any of those types of categories? Yeah, not a strong forehand player. That's for sure. Um, Forehands definitely more like utility slash like working on it for sure. That's kind of my off season goal is to add a little distance to that which is just honestly in uh working out and like throwing more for distance because i spent the last few years just kind of throwing it for accuracy more than anything um you know some of our local courses they have some like really like touchy rollers that i I really like throwing down and i'm pretty good with those too um but we're looking Mm -hmm. at like you know 325 to 360 you know kind of get it down get it left get it right kind of thing so not necessarily like big distance rollers so much as kind of like woods rollers um, I like to do okay. those a lot too. So, Kirby Parker on the board Excellent. says you're an elite putter thrower. So, oh, mm. thank you. Yeah, that's that's. I try my best for sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> and Ali out there is very excited uh, for everything that you got going on. I'm guessing you know who that is. Yes. Yeah, Ali's the man for sure. Very- yeah, yeah. He's 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 awesome. Awesome. Uh, w- w- now, in all in all seriousness, obviously, big news just dropped yesterday that Eagle McMahon leaving the team. There's also plenty of speculation as to I- if someone like Gannon and or Alden potentially uh, may be joining the team. Uh, Antala was in a conversation at one point. W- uh, do any of those conversations, do you have any of those conversations? Is any of that 
are you privy to anything? And I don't want any, you know, even if you did have it, I don't want it. But are you privy to any of those types of team conversations with other people? Um, honestly, disc golf is so small. I do hear, you know, some stuff from people that I know kind of like here and there kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. I don't really think I know anything like groundbreaking and I'll, I'll say I really don't know anything at all. Um, sure. But, you know, I, I've heard a couple of like random rumors from people that I do kind of believe and trust, but um, nothing that's really, I, you know, nothing like solidified, nothing's been confirmed. I will say this like Eagle thing has been like one of the better kept secrets in disc golf because disc golf is not necessarily like secretive with stuff you know what i mean like sure it's been talked a lot about like you know if there's a rumor like usually like that comes true and like we really haven't heard too many like strong eagle rumors so so uh, pretty interesting yep. actually yeah i feel like they were out there but they weren't quite as certain as some of the other rumors that we hear or maybe mm-hmm. seemingly as obvious when everyone i mean none of us are that bright when we're like oh i bet you gannon leaves like i i, yeah. I don't think you know, anyone's going out on any major limb there. Eagle seemed a little bit tougher to believe, uh, albeit a rumor. I feel like it was a little bit tougher to believe. Just because, like Simon, he that's that was, our, you know, his entire you know professional career. Yeah. So, so I have to ask, Kirby, <laughs> you, you, I'm, I'm going to go back to your, your, your cooking days. What is the favorite? What is the favorite thing you make for your wife? Or we'll ask, what's your wife's favorite thing that you make for her? And what's your favorite dish to make? Um, I mean, it kind of depends on like the week for her kind of thing. Um, I make this like, I make this like roasted chicken dish a lot for like when her parents come over in that. And uh, she hates it for the first like couple hours because I have to like take the bones and have them like stewing in water all day to kind of like cook down. So she always complains that the house kind of smells like roasted chicken. And then her parents come over and I like actually finish the dish and she's like, okay, this is amazing. You know, like it's all good kind of thing. So, um, that's, that's, the that's kind of been my signature dish. Yeah. That's been my signature dish for a little bit. Um, when I was in restaurants, I was doing a lot of like fun stuff. Like I would kind of mess with like molecular, molecular gastronomy a little Ooh. bit and kind of do like one of the fun things I would like to make is like bacon flavored powdered sugar and stuff like that. Like I, I had a lot of fun with it and I still kind of like, will do that once in a while. I'll kind of get the itch for like a real project kind of thing. But, uh, yeah. What, so uh, what is it? Willie, Willie Def- DeFraze, Def- DeFraze, ah, who's, um, yes, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. I, he's, I, I, he's got, I think a, a a restaurant down in Chicago that I've been meaning to get down to. Like, I want to make a weekend of yeah. it and go down there with my wife because I hear it's, it's phenomenal. And he does the same thing. When you said the molecular gastronomy is all about just these crazy ass, like different, oh, yeah. it, it I'm, I'm so excited to get down there at okay. some point in the next, hopefully yeah. the next year or so. Cause I've, I've yeah. wanted to do it forever, but that's awesome. That, that's really interesting. That guy's next. That guy's like totally next level. Mm-hmm. Like I, I've read a few of his like cooking books and kind of like seen him on like some shows and stuff. And like what he does is like way, <laughs> like way, way next level. He's incredible for sure. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I think I'm already guessing some of the, uh, freshman, uh, teammate hazing or, uh, dinner parties and who's going to have to cook. Uh, it went team oh, dismania yeah. all gets together <laughs> like well we got this guy uh he's gonna have to yeah. cook for everybody yeah <laughs> the, 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 uh, well. well that also knows i also know <laughs> that if i have a choice at, at worlds if someone happens to invite me i'm gonna go to the disc mania party this mania house yeah, for dinner point <laughs> there you go yeah, yeah yeah we'll be throwing down for sure <laughs> that's right uh so this will kind of tie uh, these pieces together which is it was just even i think last week we were talking about you know, being on the tour, the idea of some food trucks and, and things of that nature, or, um, you know, having that type of, uh, you know, uh, business model or plan. And there's a professional chef that tunes in every single week, Aaron, you're probably out there. Um, could that ever be a backup plan? Could that ever be something that would interest you, interest you whatsoever uh, in terms of uh, either following the tour or, or having a food cart or something like that? Or is that just not your style? Um, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting idea. I don't know if that's necessarily for me. Um, sure. I just don't know if, like, I don't know. I think traveling the country with a food truck would be especially, especially difficult. You know what I mean? Those things are okay. Okay. Um, a little lunky at times. So um, I don't know that, you know, that, yeah, I, like I said, like, I'm kind of out of restaurants at this point. Like, um, okay. I like, like, I like cooking and that. And unless I'm forced to go back, I'm not at this point. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair, fair enough. Is there anywhere you want to go play 
let's say international, or presumably, anywhere that you are looking forward to mixing some of that, um, you know, that excitement of food and playing and the experience, the culture. Is there anywhere that uh, jumps out at you when you think about where disc golf is now taking us all? Well, uh, my wife is Croatian, and her and her family ah. um, go to have been to Croatia like a bunch of times, and and uh, her dad like knows like where their roots are in Croatia. So I think that would be like a fun like trip with them at least, you know, to kind of okay. um, jump into like where they're from a little bit, but then also kind of show them like a little bit of like my world and kind of like you know one of the bigger events of of our side. So yeah, I would say Croatia. All right. Well, believe it or not, I have a recommendation for you. Okay. You in Croatia, you go to the Drava Forester, which is single handedly the most fun disc golf tournament on the planet. You go to the Drava Forester, you hang out with uh, everyone there, uh, Dinko, Maya, and the entire crew. You you take you partake in that, and then you get the wine tastings, you get uh, fancy dinners, all as part of it. Plus, it's this incredible party for four or five days, like. Easily one of the greatest experiences of my life is Croatia for four or five nights. So I, I'll i see you at the Drava Forester. I mean, you just pretty <laughs> yeah. much see that. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah, yeah, we'll figure it out. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. That, yeah. Seriously, that is uh, that sounds like a, a perfect tie for you uh, in order to get there. So I love it. Yeah. All yeah. right, uh, Kirby, is there is there anything else you want to share with us before we uh, before we let you go? We got a big, big shout out to, do you know Lauren Hagen? By chance, no. Um, well, huge, yes. yeah. Well, Lauren, huge super chat. So, Lauren, huge thank you to you. We got to call you. that out. That thank is you, Lauren. Very significant. So, yeah. we very much appreciate that, um, Lauren. So, thank you. Uh, anything else you want to share with us and the rest of the smashies, though, uh, before we let you go here tonight? No, I just uh, really want to thank you guys for letting me on here. You know, I'd messaged you for a couple of days and. Uh -huh. Looked at my business partner. I was just like, honestly, man, if I hear back from them at all, it'll be incredible. And when you shot me a message last night and said, let's do it, I was, I like woke my wife up. I was like, honey, I can't believe this, you know? So, <laughs> um, yeah, just, you know, thank you guys, especially for uh, giving me this opportunity and, you know, letting me get on here. Um, I really want to thank my wife, Ellie, for letting me, you know, disc golf and, you know, uh, you know, kind of just supporting me and being my best friend and all that. Mm -hmm um thank you to loft for the last couple of years of uh you know sponsoring me and you know kind of being there thank you for to this mania and specifically avery jenkins for next year and uh you know kind of setting up that and thank you to my business partner brian uh for also just like encouraging me and kind of set me up for this so yeah well heck yeah well it's not too often we have someone uh that we haven't talked to or met before hop on and and have such incredible news and such a good uh inspiring story and we wish you nothing but success here in 2024 for both your play uh your sponsorship as well as of course your your business and the store along with uh everything you're doing uh in terms of teaching and just spreading the love and the joy of disc golf so it was uh, honestly it was a pleasure to meet you and i'm so glad you reached out and uh, we're looking forward to some big things. We'll keep our eyes on you for 2024. Hopefully we're talking to you more or talking to you again uh, later in the year or something, getting an update. For sure. Yes. Yeah, anytime you guys want me back, just let me know. You know, I'd love to do it. So All right, man. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, I right. appreciate it. All right, everyone. That's right. Kirby. Have a good night. Congratulations. Thanks, you too. Bye. See ya. So when you see Kirby's right. name on, you know, some of the, 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 you know, the Pacific Northwest leaderboards you'll know where you saw him first you'll know where he made his announcement here that he's that he's now part of the disc mania team I, i'm really excited for him and again I, I said it before when he was on when someone comes on and you see suddenly a large surge in the chat just praising someone like that it's it's a good yep. sign to me and i, I think it's a good, absolutely I, I think it's a really good move from disc mania we've talked about over the last few weeks whether or not there is room for the what we're calling kind of the middle pros right now, the regional pros, the people that mm. aren't 10, 20, 10, 30, those thousand rated people that in your area are highly influential. And it sounds like Kirby fits that bill. So I'm I'm excited that Discmania is is, you know, behind that. Yeah, taking a chance, and it doesn't seem like it's uh, much of a roll of the dice. Clearly, it sounds like he's already kind of a proven entity there. So, uh, again, congratulations, Kirby, and awesome that he thought of the idea to come give us the Smashbox exclusive to tell us where he's going, and that uh, Discmania, very fortunate to be able to team up with him and uh, bring him onto the team. So, congrats.
All well, right, with that, I was going to say, while we're talking about sponsorships, let's go through the yeah. last week and see what has come up since our last conversation. I think the last thing we really kind of talked about last week was uh, Emily Beach staying with Innova. Since yeah. then, we've seen a few other names announced. Uh, Chandler Fry joining, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I believe he's doing the Thought Space Thought and Space. Team Infinite combo. Yep. So Chandler Fry signs with them. We see uh, uh, who? Uh, let's see here. I have I had a list here. Um, was Evil that McMahon left? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Braden, Braden. Uh, was it Braden Sides who joined I'd, Team Castaplast? I think that just came about today. In no, fact, if I that, recall, no, that was no. announced on the fourth. I, I saw it today. Yeah. Oh, no, okay. That, I apologize. It was announced on the fourth. Um, we we okay. we see that. Uh, let's see here. Ezra Robinson joins with uh, fact, uh, Flight Factory. He's staying Factory. as far as yep. far as I know. He's staying with Prodigy, but also Flight yep. Factory discs. So that's that's great. Um, Holland Hanley also joined Flight Factory. So we're seeing some additional sponsorship from some of the the players and that might have been one of the things that holland was hinting at when she was last on our show uh, mm. uh ali from uh, smith yep yep ali smith she is uh she also is doing the thought space infinite combo we need to come up with a good you know how like uh, celebrities have like a combo name yeah the benefer you know, yeah. the benefer we will have someone come up with something good for thought space and infinite like i'm, I'm not sure yet uh, Paul Kranz comes to MVP, follows Simon, his good friend. He's over at Team MVP, along with Silva Sarnin, which I think was a little bit more of a surprise that Silva moved over to Team MVP. Uh, we mentioned tonight that uh, Erica Stinchcomb signed with Trash Panda, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Stacey Ronsley also signing with Flight Factory. So that's mm. that's really cool. Uh, Flight Factory really building out that team. Yeah. And I say that because the, the two main people we saw, and they've of course have others, so I'm not dismissing any of them, but the two main most advertised people that we saw before being Heimberg and Madison Walker, and now seeing that they continue to grow and, and develop their team and have more sponsored players on it. Awesome to see. Yep. Tristan Tanner to DGA. He moves over there, kind of signs. Um, he was talking. I think he can do a little... I think he's doing, I don't know if it's strictly DGA because he was kind of pumping up uh, some Discraft discs as well. I don't know if he was just mm. uh, before that. Aiden Scott goes to with OTB discs for 2024. So that was one of the. I feel like um, Aiden, now is Aiden, I, I don't no. believe I. Don't, don't I mix up this. Aiden Scott, Evan Smith, and no. Evan Scott. <laughs> no, I, I I know who they are as much as I still mix them up once in a while. I at least do know who they are because I filmed all of them. I know you but have. But Aiden, is Aiden still with Prodigy and has I, just added OTB to the... I believe... The, that's That was my only... I haven't heard I, anything I mean, I saw about that. Prodigy. It, he hasn't made an announcement that he's left Prodigy, so I'm assuming he's joining. He's still with Prodigy, but they'll still the is joining OTB. additional, kind of like Paige Pierce was on Team OTB as well as Discraft. Sure. So it's I believe it's an additional sponsorship. Cole Rhode Island continues with DGA. That was announced I think yesterday or the day before. So that's that's okay. very cool. He he signed in a, a, an additional agreement, um, and as you had said, the big the big announcement that we saw. Which I was saving for last was Eagle McMahon oh. leaving Discmania. What? Because I figured that would be the one we'd probably That's, talk most that about. That is not possible because I listened to the Shanked or Hanging Loose podcast, and the gentleman on there goes by Shanked DG. He told us that Eagle's not leaving. This was like three weeks ago. He said, There's no way Eagle leaves. Well, and I just happened to be watching that podcast. He was wrong, last Terry. Night, and it was on the day that Eagle <laughs> left. So of course I had to take a jab because I've never been wrong about anything. Yeah. So uh, I follow him. I had I to make sure him I got on Twitter, it. but yes, it's <laughs> <laughs> clearly um, uh, again almost any other time. Had I listened to their, I was trying to catch up on their podcast. Had uh, any other time that was said it went to it would have been no big deal because obviously everybody's just guessing yeah. but i literally caught up on that podcast the day eagle left and it's the same day i heard him say eagle's not leaving <laughs> there's no way he leaves 
So it was it the the timing was comical to me. But well, all the rumors um, are that Eagles going to Nike now that Nike yes, and Tiger, Tiger have split. So yes, we'll we'll see that how makes, that we'll see how that goes. Um, and then the announcement sense. the announcement today um was Hannah Wynn joining Team Discraft on the tour team. No no announcement about Chris Clemens yet, but Hannah has a uh. Uh, a video out there talking about her and Dark Ace as well, which I believe she, I don't, I don't know if she's part owner or she's just a, a big one of them. No, she's just sponsored by just them. Just a, a sponsor. And for those of you that don't know, Dark Ace, Dark Ace is very much in the uh, same vein of uh, music and specifically more metal, darker music. And that, that's right up with uh, with Hannah Wynn's style, as well as Bob Julio. So my little... Uh, my little conspiracy theory that Bob just wanted friends to go to metal concerts with. He's just, he's just buying friends and, yeah. <laughs> and he'll have that. So Hannah Wynn joins team Discraft on their tour team. That was announced today. Um, uh, moving, moving teams. I think we saw that, um, uh, Morgan Linz was moved up to the, from the underground to the tour team as well. That was announced today. So pretty cool. Yeah. Congratulations to all of those uh, promotions for those that got them. I'll be the first to admit, uh, I guess I was doing random things today. The Hannah Wynn news had slipped past me. So this Ooh. is uh, this was actually Shocking, news to me Terry. to see that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, congrats to Hannah. So we're And Chris Clemens made a very funny post uh, after the announcement underneath of that, more or less just saying, oh, so that's where you took the van. Oh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, and with, with a little smiley face because... Hinting that maybe he isn't going to Discraft, but uh, I, I have a feeling that he is either going to Discraft or DGA. That's my guess for Chris Clemens. I think that they'll probably stick within the same family of discs, but I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe truly they were there because, I mean, the van was spotted and it was for Hannah. And that was yeah. that was the big announcement. Maybe Chris has something completely different lined up. Yeah, I'll be. Uh, I guess. I guess all we can do is wait and see. And Chris, if you want to be here and uh, have some conversations with us, uh, w of course we would take you. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, I will jump on it and talk about next week. We're going to have, I believe, two, uh, probably more in-depth sponsorship conversations. I don't know if I can. S I don't know if one's being spoiled. I, well, I'm going to say it. We're going to talk to Eagle McMahon, first of all. He's obviously announced. He is planning to announce next week. What? Eagle McMahon is announcing next week. That's what he had told me, is that he'll be announcing next week. He, so he's going to be on our show, and we'll be able to talk to him next week. Also, I don't know if he's told the rest of the world, but I believe there's going to be an announcement by one Dutch Napier, Batman. Oh, of course, yeah. long-time smashy. Uh, we've had some communication. He recently had parted ways with Prodigy, and I believe he's going to be all set up and ready to go and have a conversation about what his plan is here for this year. So next week, believe it or not, we're, we're a whole week scheduled out, which is very rare for us. But next week, uh, ahead of time, I can tell you, we're going to have Eagle McMahon along with Dutch, a.k.a. Batman. So that's pretty fair. cool. Eagle is not going to announce his sponsor on Smashbox, although that would be great, but he will talk about it. Oh, we could have left him hanging. Now, I I believe yeah. per Eagle and I uh, having a conversation via text yesterday, uh, I think he's going to actually be making his announcement come Monday. So uh, we will not be breaking the news. It will not be an exclusive at that point, but we're still... Happy excited. To well, we're always happy to have Eagle on. It's always awesome to talk exactly. with him and just get his. He's a very intelligent kid, and to get his perspective on things. And I can say he's a kid because he's very young. He's almost <laughs> he, still it's just well, a little more than half my age. So I was going to say he could be <laughs> your kid. He could be my kid. Thankfully, well, I mean, not young. not with how well he throws. I don't think he he uh, has any of your genes, but he will no. could log logistically be your yeah. kid. At yeah, the age of 25 and you being much older. <laughs> you can say it, Terry. I'm 45. 45. I was Like, like a record. Like uh, a record, right? I, yeah. You know. <laughs> anyway. All right. Um, is there any other major news we want to knock out now? Do we want to close down and start an after show? What are you, what are you thinking here? Well, I, like I would. 
the like we had a couple of great interviews, but well, we did have some awesome interviews. It's really nice yeah. to be able to interview, especially. I mean, I love having Jesse on, and and it's great having Kirby, someone who isn't necessarily known throughout the nation, to to get them on. Uh, the only other news I'll quickly rattle off: uh, the 2023 PDGA Player Awards were announced. So okay. these are these are the these are not the DGPT awards. Remember, those were announced earlier. Nope. These are the PDGA. Not the Smashy Awards. No, nope. not the Smashy Awards. Um, so the announcements were last week that Calvin Heiberg took the MPO Player of the Year. A lot of consistency. What? I know. Yeah. The PDGA Rookie of the Year on the MPO side was Paul Cranz, who we just spoke with. On the FPO oh. side, it was Morgan Linz, who we just mentioned. Um, the FPO Player of the Year was Kristen Tatar. Tartar. <laughs> um, I don't remember voting for her, but okay. I don't think you get a chance to vote in this one, Terry. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. So I'm I'm really upset that nobody voted for Kristen in this. Not a <laughs> no, single person. No, that is insulting <laughs> if you think about it. Super insulting that nobody voted for Kristen Tatar here. Um, and... I think yeah, I think those were the announcements. Those were those were the winners of the PDGA Players of the Year and Rookies of the Year. Uh, okay. I remember, this is calculated different than the DGPT ones. The DGPT ones only take into account, I think, DGPT events and majors. The PDGA ones also include uh, a small subsection of A tiers. They include elite series events. They include majors, um, and th there's something else. And, and there's, there's also no voting. And there's no voting. There's no voting on the PDG. Yeah, at it's, all. it's strictly a, a numbers based, and the weighting is a little different. Um, it, it's yeah. it's a different setup than the DGPT one. So that's you know, yes. Okay. Uh, all right. I don't know if there's anything else that we have that's pressing that can't be covered in the after show. See a lot of our regulars out there. Thanks so much for joining us, you guys. Keith and Tim. Another Tim. Ray. Pin high. Lots of our regulars. Uh, oh, Dutch is here. Uh oh. Uh oh. He, hey, he's Dutch. Like, he's like Beetlejuice. We just gotta say his name, and he, and he pops up. But. Uh, yes, excited to have him talk to us next week about what he's got going on. All right, well, I say we close it out for the regular show. Uh, and if there's anything we forgot, well, then it gets talked about in the after show. We can go from there. I'm going to apply some chapstick. So with that being said, big, big shout out to Kirby. Congratulations to him. Congratulations to Discmania for what appears to be a stellar pickup. Uh, Avery Jenkins out there doing the recruiting as a team manager and uh, holding things down. So congrats to them and that. Hopefully, it will be a beautiful partnership. And then, of course, thank you to Jesse over at Trash Panda. Again, we could probably ask him 3,000 more questions uh, that intrigue us. So uh, we'll certainly have to keep our eye on him and what they have going on as well. And we'll get more updates from him uh, as the year goes on. With that, that's been Podcast 488, second episode of 2024. Thank you guys so much for joining. Again, I'm going to say again, thank you to Lauren with the significant super chat. I know there was another one in there somewhere, so thank you. Uh, we appreciate you guys for joining. We're going to take a very, very quick break, and then in the after show, we'll have a giveaway and uh, come up with some other fun stuff to talk about. For Johnny V, I'm the Disc Golf Guy. That's 488. We'll see you in the after show. You step inside the Smashbox. Thank you to our $2 and above patrons. Your name is listed below in the credits. If you are interested in being listed as a producer in the Smashbox TV credits and supporting this and other fine podcasts, please visit patreon.com slash smashbox TV.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV's podcast, 488's After, After show. 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 Oh, no, Terry's your internet cutting in and out? No, it wasn't. Oh, oh, oh. Here we are. It's the After Show, 488. If you're new here, the After Show is our time to talk about anything and everything. It may or may not be disc golf related, and especially if you have something extra you want to bring to us in the chat, maybe you've got some questions, suggestions, clarifications, we'll... Uh, either BS you or point you in the right direction. So put it in the chat for us. As for I was the, saying, as we close out the show, lots of uh, the, lots yeah. of regulars on the chat. For all the pros that are listening now or in the next couple days, we know we know a lot of you listen. The 2024 World's registration schedules were posted. What should I just forget about that and not put it on my calendar, and then maybe complain later I didn't get in? Yes. So <laughs> okay, check. Here's what I want everybody listening to do. Reach out to your local pro <laughs> and say, hey, do you plan on playing Worlds? Oh, because you're 10th in the world? You're going to play? Yeah, please yeah. sign up in time because we don't want to have to make excuses for you later. Yeah, because there's a big website right now that has the registration info. Monday, March 11th, the invite list is posted. <laughs> Monday, March 18th, the emails go out. Monday, March 25th, registration is open by tier. Before you register, renew. Make sure you're certified as an official exam. And review the registration schedule that I just posted to figure out where you get to register. Because I think the registration is open by different uh, ratings, tiers, depending on what you're doing and how good you are and whether how many points you got and all sorts of crazy things. It's out there. If... There, it's yeah. out there, like everybody listening, and and not just pro worlds. There are juniors, masters, and ams that are listed as well. But those are the pro worlds ones. So I don't want to hear this year a single player complain. But you're gonna no. I don't think gonna, I will, Terry. I have faith yeah, in our will. pros. They're not nope. not a single pro should mess this up. They will. I know somebody will wait till the last moment. Somebody will then. I thought I registered. Somebody will say, "Oh man, I I I got you know ninety percent of the way through it, and then my then my phone died, and I thought it registered, and then I just didn't go back." Like every excuse I hear for my C tiers, I'm sure we'll be able to hear from them, and those will just be amplified. And then and then what we're gonna get. Is everyone coming in saying who should have been just automatically uh, signed up? Who should have been exempt? Well, they should have just done this for this player, and they should have just done that for that player. I don't believe they actually had to sign up. Yeah, if if you can't, if you, if if it's not obvious, my my uh, your sick uh, your sarcasm yeah. voice. <laughs> your sympathy is low. <laughs> sarcasm for the slash. Yeah, I just it's just it's a very very basic responsibility and nobody should have to hold your hand for the biggest well the most important tournament of your career sign up and i bet you you can do it in under three minutes. i was going to say 120 seconds yeah or 180 seconds and if you can't do it find a trusted friend that can for you just get it done so there's our PSA. <laughs> the real question is who's not going to do it? That's the question. I don't know. Oh, I thought that deadline meant this or And they get I well, here's what I like too is you just read off there's a couple weeks of like additional not additional, but there's a couple of weeks of warning leading into it. Well, not only today already in 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 January, but just in general like March March 11th, this post is March 18th, that posted. March 25th, I think a Monday, you said, available. Like, who's playing in a tournament on Monday? Nobody. Sign up. <laughs> and if you have a chance to win, you're in that first tier. Everyone that has the, the most likely chance of winning it will be included in that first tier. You might be 990 and not be able to register that first day. Fine. You're probably not winning Worlds either if we're being real. But if you have a chance to win, you're probably in that first tier and you can probably and you can sign up that day. Just do it. Hey, Artie, right. Artie on the board says, nah, if you're sponsor, your sponsor should be required to take care of it. And I think, 
Well, which yeah, sponsor? I it, it should be a players thing. I truly believe that it should be like. Yeah. I'm not saying that the sponsor shouldn't reimburse you. Maybe maybe the sponsors can remind you. But I believe the players' responsibility to sign up. Um, because then you yeah, ask you, some who which if you're Chandler Fry, which sponsor is responsible for signing you up? Is that bingo. is that Infinite Hot or space? TSA? Is it Infinite or maybe it's your bag yeah. sponsor? Maybe it's yeah. What I'm so I, it has to be up to the player, but. I would have Bingo. no issue if there was a player manager that was like, "Okay, guys, we are we're all on a Facebook chat here, or a or a, a WhatsApp, or whatever. Now's the time that you sign up. Like, there's no nothing wrong with sponsors babying players, but when it comes to actual registration, I feel like it should be up to the player because then it doesn't get weird if there's like refunds and anything like that. It can, it can all be designated to the player. But I, I understand your your perception on that i just disagree with it i think it's should be a player responsibility uh, for for the foreseeable future at least and the only the only I, I may vary on that a little bit more when we're consistently having every one of our top players maybe has a brand manager and or a a personal uh not trainer a uh you know, their personal assistant, social media. Yeah, their personal yeah. assistant slash tour coordinator. Mm -hmm. At that point, that might be a responsibility, a responsibility that gets put onto them. And I could that would be my next wave of of assumption. But just take care of it yourself. There's yeah. there's uh, if if you think I hate hearing all of those excuses, wait till I hear all of those excuses. But then it didn't even come from the player, and oh. it was someone player adjacent. That's not going to sit any better. I know who's going to I know who's going to be the one to miss it. I'm going to call him out. Emerson Keith. That guy <laughs> he he specifically told us when we saw him this weekend, we need to call him out more. I don't know about oh, what. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, so you're just going to make something up. I'm just going to make something up. The, he seemed like a really nice guy. I've met him one, once or twice before, but you know, we introduced ourselves again and and he he we chatted with him while he was playing at our uh, local indoor experience. He was flown in. It was really it was a fun event. We talked to him on uh Fri I think it was Friday night. We got to hang out yep. and he was jokingly telling us how we need to call him out on the show more. So this is me calling Emerson out. Emerson, right. don't forget to sign up. I don't think you ever have in the past, but don't do it. Yeah, don't forget to don't sign forget. up. Don't forget. Don't do, do it. Yeah. Or don't sign up. I mean, don't forget to do it. <laughs> either way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that's a way we'll be guaranteed to talk about him again, right? Is if he does forget, then we have to then call there, him out there later. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll touch on that quickly. Emerson, as you just said, in town. He was here for back to back nights. He came into the Milwaukee area on Friday. Uh, there was a singles version of the indoor night that took place about 190 players ultimately showed up to throw shots ranging from 25 feet to 150 feet uh, it's a lot of fun you've seen probably some videos you've seen simon lazat here you've seen eagle we've seen um sexton philo uh, nate sexton was here philo's been here we've seen a ton of the top pros here in the last few years this year emerson keith was here in the wisconsin version and then i believe avery jenkins is going to be in the rockford and or the dubuque version and sometimes i know chris dickerson's been to him gannon's been to them uh in the other locations uh just hats off to the entire crew uh i, I it takes an army to put on those events of traveling around and making sure that they happen for a couple of nights. And uh, I know Jeff Showers, Mike Harrington, and a couple of the ringleaders there uh, have really just done an incredible job. So big, big shout out to all of them. Um, but it was good, as you said, to catch up with Emerson and uh, walk around with him a little bit this weekend. And nothing for nothing, Johnny, spoilers in full effect here or not. He didn't have any problems with the, the putters that were in his hands. He, he even... I mean, I mean, he I, was double fisting putters and, and beverages, but yeah. but when he when he when he had to putt with a disc, it seemed to be pretty damn good. Yeah, it didn't seem so. to matter. Even towards the end of the round, it didn't really seem to matter how much he had consumed. He was still putting in putts. <laughs> and yeah, very and impressive. The, yeah, he was uh, he was a lot of fun, <laughs> and it was good to catch up with him. Yes, uh, someone asked earlier, and maybe it's not a secret right now. Yeah, I'm feeling under the weather, and I actually posted to Facebook today that mm. sitting right here in this very spot, I felt a, just a tad congested. 
in like one hour time span, I went from barely congested to complete, full, gross head, everything. I feel miserable. And, uh, you know, I know there's a big weather pattern that came in. I know that everyone's sick around the country and around yeah. around here, around the um, Wisconsin even. Um, yeah. Uh, so hopefully I'm going to get some good rest and continue to drink some fluids. But I am I do not feel well at all. That's yeah. <laughs> if you couldn't tell. So on Saturday, I went, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get off the subject a little bit. And I went to my son's uh, robotics announcement this is saturday they do the big announce they did the big announcement of as far as what the what the game is that they have to build these robots mm. to play and i just want to say that i think that the colorado team headed up by joe revere might have a good chance it's very uh -oh. di it's very disc golf themed almost i had a couple of parents come up to me and be yeah, like isn't hey. it throwing a disc though what was that a frisbee? Isn't it launching a frisbee or a disc or something? It's different every year. Every year they come up with a new game. Oh, okay. And so sometimes, but this year's game is you you need to build a robot that can pick up more or less a, a, a cushiony kind of ring. And that ring needs to go into a, you, the, you, the, it needs to be shot out of your robot into a particular spot. And there's all sorts of funny, they're theming it after music. So I think they call that, they're calling that the amp. It needs to put the disc or it puts the, the ring in the amp. And then you, it has to go over to the speaker, which is what they're calling it, which is more or less just an area with a chain that has to lift itself up and put one of these rings flat and drop it in. But then there's a portion where you can, and I'm not getting all the rules right because I only watched it once and they're super complicated. After your robot puts something in the speaker, your team can hit one of two buttons. One's a collaborative button where both teams can get points. And one's like a solo button where only your team can get points, but I think it lasts less time. I don't know. But either way, then one of your players has to take it, the ring and toss it into or onto a specific spot, like a disc. Yeah. I had two to three different parents come over to me and they're like, hey, you, you do that disc golf thing, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. So your son, he's that's his job, right? He's going to be the one throwing the... And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, he's never uh, really like... Like, he's played with his friends in the backyard and, you know, he he can hit a 25-foot putt once in a while because he's more or less just kind of all wrist. He just takes it and spins it and flings it. So it's it's always on a hyzer and it's always 100 miles an hour. Um, and I'm like, goo. I'm like... Maybe. I mean, we can train if that's like going to be his job, if he gets real good at it. But I don't think he has any advantage over any other kid other than his height. <laughs> that he's six, six and sure. you have to, it's on the top of something. I think he has got to get it up like <laughs> six foot, uh, six, nine or six, 10. I think is where the top of the pole is that you have to launch. The person has to launch the, the Frisbee. But I was, all I was thinking is like, man, we should have Joe Revere back on. Cause he's the head of their robotics teams. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and talk to him about what he thought of this big reveal, um, of all the different, uh, the game and how it really did feel a little disc golf related, but yeah, it's not every year that they do Frisbees or rings. Sometimes they have to pick up certain balls and throw them, or it's always some sort of game they make up. It's going to drive me crazy, but it was many years ago. I went to one of those competitions. And, and I can't, for the life, remember who it, whose it was. I don't know, but like, they they did say the that this one is like that I went a, to watch a remix of an older event. So maybe you happen to go the same year, whether it was 2019 or 2017 or something, wh wh whatever year that this is. This is kind of like a modified version of that year's game. Oh. So maybe you happen to go that same year that this was the original game. So yeah, I don't know. I just I'm I. It's gonna drive me crazy thinking about who's who's. Who I went to watch in the first place, though, like who was involved? Ah, ah, uh, it must have been. I bet you it was Al to the G, uh, oh, Al sure. Gilgenbach. I bet you him. And I bet you it was either the yeah. team. Yeah, the team he either ran and or, or maybe his son was involved. A, a fellow disc golfer. I just remember going to one of the kind of finals or semifinal competitions here in Milwaukee. Obviously, a really big deal and undertaking. And I remember going to it. And uh, yeah, that's who it must have been. I'll have to reach out to him. Anyway, 
All right. Um, well, I mean, my countdown is officially on. I'm just going to say this. I am uh, getting that much closer. Uh, we'll have to have a conversation about the couple of weeks I'm in Asia as to some timing. Sure. But uh, as uh, these next few weeks get closer, I will be heading off to Singapore along with Malaysia and Thailand uh, in the next few weeks. So looking forward to that. I thought I'd throw that out there uh, just as a quick reminder. Um, do we have a, we have another guest lined up? Oh, it's in a few weeks, uh, yes. so we'll talk about that. But yeah. I think we're gonna have a guest talking about the Northeast Disc Golf Expo. That's what it is. Uh, is uh, I believe we're gonna have intern Ben on the show, and he's gonna talk a little bit more about what's going on for that event. So uh, I thought I'd throw that out there as well, as that's continuing to grow, which is awesome. You guys are seeing posts all over, and it's awesome to see that somebody's taking that idea and running with it similar and different to you know i think initially what we were going to see out in uh, las vegas in, in terms of the big disc golf expo that was going to take place there that didn't end up unfolding and now we're seeing and i don't know if this is quite to the scale that vegas originally was going to be i don't think we're see, we're not seeing as much golf interaction so to speak but i think in terms of the overall attendance uh, along with players and vendors and manufacturers it seems like it's hitting the mark, so I'm I'm excited to hear more about what's going on for that event in a few weeks. All right, I'm going to read off the board. Someone had asked. Um, oh, this is kind of this ties it together. It's exciting. Uh, Tim on the board says, "Is Philo planning to defend?" Funny you say that. Speaking of people who don't sign up, uh, <laughs> so I'll call them out. Yeah, Philo. Uh, and I had a conversation. I reached out to him about two weeks ago. I said, hey, Philo, are you, are you coming back to Samui? You're like a three-time champion there. Every time you've been there, I've been there. Uh, or every time I've been there, you've already been there and you're winning. I've been filming it. You know, you you clearly you know love the heck out of that trip. Sign up. It's like getting full. He's like, oh, thanks for the heads up. Two weeks later, I get a text from Philo. Hey, man, it's full. That's how registration works, guys. It fills up. Um, Philo is very fortunate that uh, our buddy Luke over there on Samui at Samui Disc Golf uh, is going to make an adjustment to actually we're going to expand all the fields so that we're going to have kind of a three-flight day instead of a two-flight day. So everybody still will just play their, their round of 22 holes, two rounds of 12, uh, two rounds of 11, except for now it's going to be... Um, you know, a, a slightly earlier round, then a middle round, and then a final round each day. So you'll you'll still play just one round a day over the three days. So nothing really changes except for what time you were going to start at, and that's getting shifted by a half hour or an hour. So Philo, along with some others, are going to be able to get in, and maybe most importantly, that means there's more room in the event uh, for those that are still um, on the fence about trying to get in. There was about 10 people on the waiting list, so all of them are going to be excited, including one Philo Brathwaite. So, nope, nope, no, no champion exemption there, Tim. Nope, 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 nope. Which brings to another point, Johnny. Okay. In a completely different event, an A tier. I saw someone make a post recently saying, "Hey, that sucks. The event is full. Uh, you would think defending champion would get." A spot. Would you like to see that implemented at any level of event? No. Not at any level. I think okay. I don't I don't see a point in B and C tiers. I, I just okay. I just I just don't. Um and then because then I have to ask like do you if somebody wins in amateur or advanced do you hold the okay. spot for them and open then if they've moved up? Do they only get the spot if they stay in the same thing? Does this only apply to pros? Does it only apply to pro masters and pros? If I'm 49 and now I'm moving into the grandmasters, does that count even though I'm a pro? I don't necessarily, I, I don't think for B and C tiers, it's, it's really uh, needs to be a thing. I wouldn't, I'm not opposed to doing it. I think maybe, maybe A tier and above, 
I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be a requirement by any means. I think it's optional. I think if, if the TD says, Hey, guess what? If you win or even take top five, part of the reward, part of your, uh, your win is that we will hold a spot for you next year, which could be kind of valuable on some events because we've seen in the past where events fill up really fast. You know, I, I don't know what the current state of <laughs> tournament registration is, if it's filling up in three to four minutes, like we've seen in the past, but I'm sure there are still events in areas of the country where that happens. I think it could be a cool incentive to say, we're going to hold next year. You are going to get an automatic spot after, you know, we will notify you by the email that we currently have. And you have one week to sign up after registration opens. We've held these spots. If you don't sign up within a week, too bad, so sad. You know, I think that could be a cool compensation for winning MPO, FPO, whatever those numbers are. And if you did want to extend it into other divisions, fine. I just think that's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, open. Uh, I, and, I think. And FPO would be the ones where I would look. And above. Like, it, yeah. Well, those those are the above. So I well, elite I series like, majors. You know, oh, okay. I, 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 I could see something like that happening. I feel like the you hit the nail on the head with what the most difficult scenarios are when somebody is either eligible and or wants to play in a different division. Because then, what are you really? You know, what are you guaranteeing them? And and I would use the example. We'll play pretend and say it's advanced masters. You win advanced masters. You're eligible for advanced grandmasters, or in theory, you could be playing a pro masters or whatever, or in that next year, a pro grandmasters if you're of age. Where do you hold the spot? Is it well, should it be assumed it's when you're moving up no. or not? And then where do you hold that given spot? And I think that MPO and FPO is relatively easy unless again you you win you win the event at age 39 and the next year someone's like well they should have held him a master spot you know he's master's age he won the tournament you could it just we could split this you know you, 60 different ways right yeah you could just say hey here are the winners in theory you could say here are the winners from last year maybe you just we'll just say you do winners terry according to pdga rules can you let them sign up first I, I don't know the uh, PGA rules as far as tiering and op opening up to specific players. Because if you said, hey, guys and girls, no matter what, if you win a division, we will, you have seven days to sign up for any division you want. You get first dibs on that. If you want, if you're an AM master and you want to stay in AM masters, awesome. If you want to move up to open, great. If you want to go to pro master, I don't care as long as you're eligible for the division. Nowhere do I ever think that the, the the entry fee should be covered. I just think it should be open for them to... It could be, not should. I don't ever say should. It could be open for them to sign up. I don't have a problem if that were the case. I don't care the division. The tournament, it's the TD. It's a, it's a little extra work, but I know it's not really too difficult a week ahead of time to say, hey, these are the players that won last year. I'm opening up registration on January 1st, but you know what? December 25th, they are allowed to sign up. I'm going to give them the option to sign up first for whatever division. There's eight people, assume you have eight to 10 divisions, whatever, that are in the event. And then everybody else gets to get in. Or you do your tiered from there, whatever. I don't know the exemptions that you're allowed with the PDGA. Um, well, that's I will what I'm say looking this, up right now. I will say this, no matter what the rules are for the PDGA, I know that you can probably bend them. Because there's no one that's... If you're the tournament director, I'm sure you could probably find a way to guarantee someone to get into an event. Whether that's PDJ legal or not, I don't know. But I guarantee you as a TD, I've seen it happen, Harry, that a tournament director has made, it, made sure that a specific player, sometimes maybe it's even me, <laughs> has gotten into an event. I, I'm currently looking through the 2024 PDGA Tour standards for because if there is a set threshold or limit, I want to know exactly what it is. There's a certain amount of spots you can offer up for people to pre-register based on 
like a sponsorship exemption. You know, you you can't you can't open up a tournament and say, "Hey, uh, every single spot could be sold out early and given to only people that are are sponsoring the tournament." Like they they have a threshold. So similarly, I want to know if there's an invitation standard and uh that's i'll have to look that up so it's not just uh me digging around here on the uh internet yeah that's that and yeah, that's fine and maybe somebody off the top of their head can point me directly to it uh pdga please make uh da, 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 da. nope that's not i'll have to look for it yeah warren webb says pdg I, I know make you it can... where historical scorecards show what hole folks started on in a shotgun start it should be yeah, so I did simple see that. to do I, I don't know how simple it is i've looked at I've looked at the back end of the PDGA and I don't recall if there is a starting hole on the API. I'm sure there I'm sure there is um just based on what you can designate. That seems very it seems very specific that not a lot of people would probably need that. It would be again, every little bit of data we can get is a bonus, but I don't necessarily think that that's a huge priority for the PDGA. And Warren Webb says it does tell oh, a story. You're right. Any, you can make a story out of anything. I agree. Um, there are, you know, two dozen other things I think I would like to see the PDGA accomplish before that. Now, that could be a one-hour job. That could be a 10-hour job for them. I, I, I don't know. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be, again, that's one of those things where it's like, I would never be opposed to something like that. If that, if suddenly it showed up on, you know, the final results or, what hole they started on cool or what time they started at because that's technically not available on the PDGA site either. You can't look after they've started. You don't know what time a player starts. You could, that could lead that's that. And maybe this is a stat Mando. Yeah. Warren web or web Warren reach out to stat Mando because that's the type of thing that they would probably be great at now in there. So they could, you know, you, you hear pros complain about these people that always get to start later in the day. And the statistical analysis of if they play better and whatnot. Cool. Maybe that's something Stat Mando can look at. Hey, guess what? We've we've taken all the players who start after noon every day on the Pro Tour and the players who've started before noon and looked at their, you know, their average rating compared to their current rating. I'm sure there's a, some statistical thing that I'm dumb and that they're smart. I'm ugly and they're beautiful. I'm a child. Well, as, long as, we got, as, long, <laughs> as long as we got that clear, happy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I'm sure it's something that maybe they could look at and figure out. So I, it could be cool, but they definitely reach out to Stat Mando on something like that. Put that on their project list. Um, yeah, uh, unlimited permitted exceptions. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to put it. It's in the competition manual. Again, I'm going to read this a little later. I'm going to put a link here because I think the answer is exactly within that link that I just posted. But it does talk about uh, exceptions and limited ones. TDs um, cannot allocate more than a third of the event spots, uh, da, 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 so on and so forth. Oh, that's going to drive me crazy. Because uh, we've there's seen a volunteers some... exception, an yep. event sponsorship exemption, affiliate club except uh, exceptions, exemption. not exemptions. Sorry, no, it says exceptions. Exceptions. Um, okay. In this case, but I I do want to know. You um, could guess. I, you could probably file that under a sponsor exception because if you technically, uh, you, th that's part of your sponsorship to the player is holding them a spot, maybe. I could see that fitting if you wanted to wedge it in there. I could see that fitting a sponsor exemption or exception, depending on what you want to say, for that particular um, event if you did it with the winners. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. That's pretty, I, I think you could do that. Okay. Well, don't take any PDGA tournament directing legal advice from Johnny V. It would be my disclaimer. No, of course not. But I would do it. Look into it. <laughs> I was just going to say, look into it. Uh, I, that does bring up a good point. Webb, I think I saw him post it somewhere else on the on the webs this last week, which is we're, you know, an event or, or I'm sorry, a weekend or two, technically, right? One weekend into the year. I guess just one. How has scoring for the entire group gone? That would be, I think, a very fair question. I wonder if anyone has any stories 
I wonder if anyone has any good or bad uh, as to how scoring where everyone on the card had to keep score this last weekend. Uh, Johnny nor I participated in it, any uh, sanctioned events. I'd be curious to know how that went and if there was any pushback or blowback or or you'd have to think an event that's this early in the season probably like really helped drive the point home so that it wouldn't be a, a shock to their players, but I guess anything's possible. So I'd be curious to know if anyone had any feedback. Webb says, I had mixed results this past weekend. And by results, do you mean um, people complaining about it, people having challenges technology-wise or, or phone batteries dying? Or like when you say mixed results, people, <laughs> four people on the card and three of them had, the, had different scores. When you say mixed results, I'd be curious to know, or mixed reactions. You know, did anyone put up a major fight or, you know, was there any uh, Karens or Chads running around that were screaming about not wanting to do it? I mean, we asked, uh, or Emerson Keith got asked, I think, this weekend about it. And if I recall, his answer was pretty straightforward. We're playing golf. Keep your score. Like, yeah. It's, it's funny how it's this much of a conversation. You're playing in a competitive sport. And you're being asked to keep score. If you just like put it at face value right there, that doesn't sound all too crazy, does it? Like, <laughs> I guess there's some machinery, but for the most part, you're responsible for scorekeeping. In no, I guess you're not. You're really not. In, in uh, and again, I was gonna say any individual sport. No, you're not. Yeah, you, you run around and do the. There are so many options. Olympics. <laughs> ways to keep score. You can do it on the PDGA. You could keep a score disc, a score on UDISC if you wanted to. Sure. You could keep a score on a paper scorecard. Like, and if you have, as I think we were mentioning to Emerson, we were talking to Emerson about it. If you have a caddy or a support person, you can have them do it. Like there's, yeah. if you, if you truly hate keeping score, like if it's that awful to you, <laughs> then find a support person or a new hobby. Or a new hobby. <laughs> uh, Artie says Twitter does suck right now. Okay. I'm, I'm not, I don't no. know where that's coming from. Oh, that's because they were talking about something on Twitter. And I said, Twitter's awful. Everyone on Twitter is awful. Yes, I am on Twitter and I am awful <laughs> for being on Twitter. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, yes. I, I, okay. I know, like, I'm swimming in the sewage. I know that. I, I would love uh, to get off of Twitter because there's almost nothing good on Twitter. Uh, Glenn pretty, said we had three, trashy. three do live scoring. One questioned it, then did you just scoring? Webb said they were not into it, and multiple times we had to repeat all scores and correct paper scorecards. Yeah, I could see that in the yeah. first weekend. It's going to take a little while because somebody's going to forget for two or three holes, and you're like, oh crap, and then you go back and you're like, hi, hey, can you fill in these last two or three scores and and whatnot? It's it's going to happen, like. Um, we'll get, Buzz we'll, says not we'll every disc golfer needs to play competitive. Needs to play? Uh, no, I agree with that. Well, you, if you're out there with just your buddies and you're not playing in a sanctioned event, then you don't need to keep scoring. I'm totally good with that as well, but no one's forcing you to. It's now just one of those you know, official requirements yeah. of playing in a PDGA and, event. So. And like Tim says, if everyone's scoring on the PDGA, it will immediately show discrepancies. If someone puts down a three versus a four on two different cards, you'll you will get all of that. Yeah, which I, I do love that component for sure. And what also is cool is uh, I would assume the, is the PDG app, uh, it allows you to probably take, first of all, you don't have to see everyone's running score, uh, if I recall. And Correct. also, does it allow that. you to turn, uh, disable all, I mean, you could disable, just do the scoring where you don't have to, you can disable all notifications. I guess that's more of a you doing it on your phone kind of thing yeah, if you don't want to get notifications. Thing. Anyway, all right. Um, yeah. It would, so it would uh, be interesting if with the PD. I think the PDJ is a web app with a wrapper, and I think you can do notifications now if you want. If we want to get into the little technicalities okay. of it, but um, I think it could be kind of interesting if, if um, let if there was a something behind the scenes. Now that everyone has to keep score, if you start a scorecard, and let's just say you're on hole three, two people get the scores. You don't put in a score for hole three. After five minutes or something, it looks at, oh, 
There's two out of three scorecards that have been scored. Why didn't this one score? And it sends you a notification. It says, ding, hey, you you know, missing a score on score th- on hole three or something along those lines. I think that could be kind of cool, a, a cool feature, just in case someone forgets. Maybe they put it in the wrong hole. Like literally, I'm sure that could happen. You're, you're, you score, you're supposed to score hole three. You accidentally score hole four. And, you, and you're going on from four, five, six, because somehow you missed three. It's been a while since I've scored on the PDG Hey app, um, so you'll yeah. have to forgive me. It's, I think it's been a year or so, and I don't know if they've changed or updated anything. I know they're going to be doing some really big, uh, some big stuff in this off season. They're really excited, so I, I am, I am as well. But I, I think that could be kind of a cool feature. Like, oh hey, how come two of these scorecards have scores on three and you don't? Yeah, or what are you thinking just about? No, yeah, like what, 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 what's going on? <laughs> Why did you screw it up? Why did you miss it? Were you going to the bathroom when they were scoring? Were you, you know, just have a 15 line notification. <laughs> just, just all the options. What were you doing, dummy? You have to, yeah, you have to fill it back out like a survey. Yeah. Everyone says you took a six. Don't cr- stop crying and write down your score. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. I don't know if there's anything else on the board that we need to question. Are the paper scorecards required to be turned into the TD? That's a good question. I don't, I didn't, I have <laughs> the two events that I potentially would run this year. One's not until like April, May, or June. The other one's not until October or November. So I'm not sure that, uh, I'm sure those questions will all be answered by the time I'm ready to running them. I'm sure. Uh, the only other thing on the board was Terry was people asking about uh, wanting us to go all Midwestern and talk about the Packers. The Packers the beat Packers. the Bears. They beat the Bears. We're going on uh, like uh, 10 straight years of beating the Bears. Yeah, was, Eight yeah straight it's kind years of crazy. Yeah. Dude, uh, we're just, we're just yeah. dominating them. <laughs> it is funny that this is one of the oldest rivalries in all of football and it's been completely lopsided now for the last uh like you said eight ten years or whatever um yeah, and it was, it's not like oh it's you know they're they're uh you know 12 and 8 or 14 and 6 like we're like 18 and 0 against them i think yeah. in the last nine years or whatever it is so that is pretty incredible yeah, it was really lopsided yeah, towards the, the playoffs. I was gonna say it was lopsided towards the Bears in the '80s when they were dominating the Packers, um, and then obviously with Favre coming in, it became a little bit more even. But the Packers, I think, still kind of started to edge up. Um, and then since Rodgers came in, he he has just. I mean, as the joke is, he owned the Bears. He he signed over the ownership of the Bears, handed it to Jordan Love, and said, "Keep up the streak, there, little man." And and went on from there. So it's it's great. The Packers now, because of the win over the Bears, made the playoffs. They're gonna go down to uh they're going down to Dallas to play the Cowboys, which in theory the Cowboys are a better team. They should beat us. They've got a great defense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um they've got a really good offense. But if there's one thing that Packer fans know, if there's a chance Mike McCarthy will screw up the play clock or the time in a playoff game, he'll do it. If there's a chance, he will do it. So if it if it gets close towards the end, I'm just counting on McCarthy just to screw up, you know, call a wrong timeout, miss a timeout, just delay of game, just forget where he's at. I mean, there's a really good chance. And the Cowboys have not fared well in the playoffs the last few years. So I I, I think the Packers are not going to win. But anything can happen. That's why they play the game. It'd be fun. We're, That's we're, right. We're really hot at the right time. So it's cool. It's awesome to see. Well, Youngest team in the NFL. We'll Youngest team since 1977, I think, to make the playoffs. And then you and I were bored, and then everything just got older. Correct. We, everything somehow. just got, kept getting older after we were born. <laughs> Uh, yes, we'll we'll see how that all unfolds. Definitely exciting. Uh, if you're a Midwestern Packers fan, there was a significant loss of hope at some point during the middle of the season, uh, it felt as if. And so to have things turn around and, like you said, be trending and, and hot at the right time, uh, we'll see how it all pans out. So looking forward to it. Um, reading off the board, ain't no ch- uh, yeah. I don't know if there's anything else. Oh, th- there was some other big news. Um, as exciting, as excited as I personally am 
about the idea of possibly being able to go to Mexico later in the year uh, to check out an event that they're hosting uh, over just outside of Mexico City. That's in the works, uh, hopefully. Uh, also, Innova had announced a collaboration that they're doing that will involve one uh, Dave Matthews band. And well, I not, forget who else. Not 100%. It is not Dave no? Matthews Band. It is Dave oh, Matthews is just Dave Math and Tim oh. Reynolds, who kind of have a okay. side. I think they kind of have a side gig. It's not the Dave Was Matthews. Was Tim Reynolds in Dave Matthews Band? I don't know for sure. Because that would be really weird. I, I, I think as someone said he used to be a solo artist. So I don't know if he's... I don't, I don't know if... I don't think he's in Dave Matthews Band. So I think you're not going to get the... I don't believe you're getting the full Dave Matthews Band. I think you're getting... Dave Matthews and Tim Reynolds in going to uh, on a on a cruise, and they're having uh, Innova's collaborating with them for disc golf. But I don't. Again, I, I don't. Not that there's a huge difference between Dave Matthews and Dave Matthews Band, but I don't think you're going to get the full band thing. It might just be Dave Matthews. So I, <laughs> there's a little clarity to be had there. I think. All right. Well, uh, if oh, it's not known, obvious, Johnny. Johnny nor I are huge Dave Matthews fans uh, and have had never really claimed to be, so that's why we're not up on all the uh, official. But, yeah, I'm looking at it now. I'll put the link in the chat if you have not seen this. And Glenn Reiser uh, says that Tim is now in the band has, and has been there for a few years. So he was not there originally okay. but has joined the band recently. So you're getting two out of the 27 members of Dave Matthews' band. All right. Well, it uh, it is out there. Uh, Riviera Maya and uh, looks like Moon Palace February 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th. Uh, it lists a nine hole beginner fun course, 18 hole pro level tournament, singles and doubles competitions, arm speed challenge, lessons with disc golf pros, putting contest, and more. So I'm excited uh, for that. Very and cool. More. Uh, I like the and more. Um, so very cool and hope they have uh, a great time. That is what the same week or weekend as it's essentially the same weekend as the all-star. Oh, no, excuse me. Yeah. No, it's in March, isn't it? Or is it in February? No, February. Okay. I thought it was in March. Let's do yeah. the math here. February 15th through the 18th. And when I pull up a calendar, that's, uh, the all-stars is going to be taking place on the 16th, 17th and 18th. And this is the 15th through the 18th. So it's all-star weekend. Okay. So there you go. So best of luck. I think somebody else earlier on the board said something about it being about 3000 bucks, whatever it is. I, I hope it's fun. And I hope uh, a bunch of people go out and enjoy it. Sounds like a really cool opportunity. Again, you nor I are just diehard uh, Dave Matthews fans, but it sounds like it could be a lot of fun. No, I've been, uh, I've been known to not to, to, to truly mock Dave Matthews band fans yeah. <laughs> in the past. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with them. I, I it's, it's, I've got friends that are heavily into him, and I just make fun of them. But uh, so Jeremy London, yes, is a actor slash writer as part of the, or was he a, was he a writer he's, of any kind or just actor? I don't know if he's done any writing, but he's primarily an actor. He's many of you will know him as TS from uh, from Mallrats. That's where I first saw him. He's got a twin brother who also does acting. Um, and he, I mentioned this a few weeks ago when we were talking about a celebrity pro-am event. He is also, he's starred in a few other movies. Um, nothing huge after Mallrats. I mean, I think he kind of had a little run as a, maybe as slightly as like a, a, a teen, not quite teen, but a young heartthrob. Um, but he, a couple of years ago, he caught the disc golf bug and he's been very much on Twitter just he talks about disc golf all the time and i believe he's joining a yeah. podcast yeah uh, and that's that's where i was tying this all together no he is not but i believe they may have even recorded tonight uh they don't necessarily go straight to live but the hanging loose podcast uh i mentioned them a little bit earlier uh with spicy boy and shanked dg uh they i believe were going to have him as one of the guests so uh if you're Good into everything that johnny just said and yeah um it looks like he'll be joining. So, yeah, cool. that's that, that's. I'm honestly, I'll say this. I'm a little envious of them. Obviously, I've I've been a I've been a Kevin Smith fan for a very very long time. I've seen him live. I've seen mo all of his movies. Um, and 
Jeremy London, when he started doing disc golf, it was something in my head that I wanted to reach out to him at some point and get him on the show. And I just never made the the ambition. I've we've gone back and forth on Twitter a little bit, but I never really had a, never really got the chance to bring him on. And I know you you particularly Terry probably have very very little reference to him, but uh, good for them. I will listen to that podcast. I'm I'm interested to to hear about what he is. He's he's very vocal on Twitter as well yeah so i just wanted to sh- throw that out there that uh, one of our newer podcasts in disc golf uh, again that's the hanging loose disc golf podcast uh they're going to be having him so if you guys are a fan you should certainly check him out all right johnny i don't uh i don't think that i have a whole lot more um except for the one thing i didn't share with you that uh, this weekend on saturday night friday night we hung out with emerson keith and the rest of the crew for the indoor Saturday night, uh, me and a couple other disc golfers, good buddies, uh, Dustin and Paul, who have done some great disc golf uh, work. Uh, we headed up to Sheboygan, Wisconsin, the home of one Barry Schultz and three sheeps brewing, which was more of the concern for me. They happened to make my favorite Imperial stout, uh, known as Wolf. And we also managed to drag out. Our good college buddy Ryan Hornicle. Oh, and, uh, Hornicle came out. <laughs> it was it was a good time, and Ryan has run plenty of tournaments in Wisconsin. Not so much anymore right now, but uh, very much uh, active. We introduced him to disc golf in college, and uh, you know we've somewhat grown he, apart over the last few years as he lives about an hour, hour and a half from us, and or about an hour, and um, has kids and family and all that other stuff and is still teaching but is uh yeah so it was good to, it was good to I pull would... him out and we rehashed quite a few old old late 90s early 2000 stories uh with him with regard to disc golf it was a good time for reference um i would really put him right along the lines of like a james conrad that's how you can imagine Ryan Hornicle very much into he was always good at he was always good at art and juggling and he didn't throw as far as Conrad, but long hair. No, but, um just yeah. v- very much kind of similar frame. <laughs> very similar frame as a James Conrad, but um yeah, th- that's where uh that's that uh, for reference I, I kinda I could put the two next to each other. Yeah. So anyway, good time. Uh, great to hang out there and great to catch up with an old disc golf buddy who has quite a memory of some of our old school stories. And uh, it, it would be, be funny good. to, <laughs> yeah, some, some of those stories are better than others, but uh, <laughs> overall it was certainly a good time. So congratulations, I guess what some of uh, there's a big football game last night with some college teams and uh, one of the Harbaugh's won. Is that what Mich- I saw? Yeah. Michigan won. I, I don't follow a lot of, College I, sports. But congrats! But I, I know Michigan. I'm beat sorry Washington. to the team that lost, and I'm I'm happy for the team that won. So uh, that that's all I can say on that. Yeah. As knowledgeable as we are. All right, we're gonna close it out again. We've already got no. guests lined up for next week. No. Oh, we got a giveaway. I have a Holy Patreon shnikes. giveaway, Terry. Yeah, we got to forget away. about patreoncom slash TV where you can How sign could up I ever? and for as little as a dollar a month. Be eligible for our weekly giveaway that there are 136 people this week that are eligible for our what? weekly giveaway on smashbox no way. tv no that way patreon.com got... slash smashbox tv yeah look at those stickers a couple of sweet stickers uh we got some of these in stock so most of the time when i am shipping out now a smashbox patreon giveaway you Often we'll get one of these stickers. If I don't do that, I go with uh, a different style of Smashbox sticker that we also ordered up not too long ago. So you get one of these fancy little fellers, little three-inch uh, sticker. So, or sometimes I go both. You get both of wow. them. I don't know. It just depends how generous I'm feeling. You but, were handing those yes. out like candy at the at the indoor experience. Yes, spreading some love around. So we'll find something here in my office. That's what I was just looking around for. Is I know uh, maybe something here in my office that we could give away. I mean, it's it seems like a no brainer to go with more uh, Samui discs. Uh, as I'm going to be heading there soon. Uh oh. Well, if you Uh-oh. had a trash panda disc, I'd tell you to recycle it and. <laughs> Yeah, we got cloud breakers. R.I.P. Cloud 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 breaker rules. Uh, these are on discount now since Eagle has left the building. Maybe not. All right. Anyway, anyway. 136 people are eligible for our giveaway tonight. Terry, is there a specific number 
or way that you would like to do this. I've, I've started my uh, email address. Email. It's the second podcast of the year. So let's go with the second number you draw. All right. Our first number we drew is 71. Our second number we're drawing is 59. 59. So let's look oh, at what's going to be a, is. A, J, a, a, a J. Uh, let's start with a J. An H. Oh, not too far. That's Ryan far. Hunt. Congratulations, Ryan. Ryan Hunt. Hunt. Ryan Hunt, sweet. you are our winner tonight. Uh, Terry will get you a sweet piece of plastic. From, and a sticker. And a sticker, hopefully. Don't yeah. forget the sticker. I'll for sure get the sticker in there. All right, well, good. Might hopefully you get more than just a sticker. sticker. <laughs> <laughs> you might you might not get a disc, but you'll definitely get a sticker. No, you'll get a disc you'll and sure a, sticker, a sticker, hopefully, there. So thank you, Ryan Hunt, for being a Patreon supporter. It looks like you've been a Patreon supporter for about a year now. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Sweet. Very cool. Yes, we certainly appreciate it. All right. I think with that, now I think I can officially uh, close it out. We're sick. I got more work to do, and then I'm going to get to bed. Uh, big, big shout out to Jesse Stedman from Trash Panda, who joined us in the regular show. Uh, we also had Kirby Snyder join us in the regular show. Congrats to him and his new sponsorship, and congrats to all the energies and efforts that we're seeing out of Trash Panda, their whole crew, their uh, their the, him, his employees, and now he's even got uh, Erica Stinchcomb on board as a sponsored player. Awesome to see and uh, very inspirational for all the hard work and the dedication that he's been putting in over these last few years. And if you don't, you probably already do this, but if you don't, uh, go out there and subscribe to his YouTube channel. It's, it's just phenomenal. Um, not only does he do everything so... Uh, it's so inspiring and he does it so well. Then he documents it on top of it and is a great, uh, as he said, tells the story and he does such a phenomenal job of it. I'm jealous of all the good stuff he does. I just get colds, voice stickers. All right. With that, this has been podcast 488's after show. Thank you guys so much for joining us here on our new time at eight o'clock central. And we start next week, Dutch Napier, a.k.a. Batman, along with Eagle McMahon. Those are at least two of our guests. There could be more. We'll be coming to you for 489. We'll see you then. You step inside the Smashbox.